executive session of the Board of Commissioners of the City of Tarpon Springs on Tuesday, November 7th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Roll call, please. Mayor Vazquietti. Here. Vice Mayor Lund. Here. Commissioner Eisner. Here. Commissioner Koulias. Here. Commissioner Koulianis. Here. Uh, this evening's invocation will be given by Reverend Kurt Snare of St. Timothy's Lutheran Church. If we can remain standing and pledge the allegiance to the flag immediately after the invocation. The Lord be with you. Heavenly Lord, we thank you for the gift of this city that you've given us. We pray that you would help us to be good stewards. Please teach us to love one another and to honor you by honoring our neighbor, that this might be a city that others look at and see your glory. Lord, we pray that you be with our commissioners and all who dwell in this city. Give us peace and be with those who lead. Give them your wisdom that they might guide us in ways that help us to be good stewards. We pray all of this in the name of the Most High God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, to and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, before we get started, there's two items that are deferred uh, this evening. Item 13 is deferred to November 14th. That's the purchase of vehicles. And also item 25 is deferred to December 5th. That's the conditional use for a cafe at the corner of Park Street and Roosevelt Boulevard. This evening we have a uh, proclamation to celebrate National Native American Heritage Month. Um, I wish to thank uh, Mr. Delacus for uh, connecting us with Mr. Robert Rosa of the American Indian Movement of Central Florida. He couldn't be here in person. He's, I'm gonna hope he's on Zoom. Mr. Moray, if you could arrange that if he's here. And um, I'm gonna read the uh, proclamation and see if Mr. Rosa's on Zoom for a couple of comments. And then uh, we'll mail the uh, proclamation to Mr. Rosa and the American um, Indian Movement of Central Florida. Mr. Rosa, if you are in attendance, please raise your hand in the Zoom call. Okay. Whereas during National Native American Heritage Month, we celebrate indigenous people past and present, and whereas Native American contributions and values have shaped the social, political, environmental, and economic fabric of our country, while also enhancing freedom and prosperity, and whereas the Native American communities have provided values and ideas that have become ingrained in American culture, including respect for the natural environment and rich cultural history. And whereas the city of Tarpon Springs promotes diversity, inclusivity, and respect for all individuals in our community. And whereas the city of Tarpon Springs joins others across the nation in celebrating and acknowledging National Native American Heritage Month and whereas the observance offers increased opportunity to better understand Native American heritage, past and present contributions to our communities and to honor the many indigenous people who have sacrificed their lives, lives and customs for the growth of our nation. Now, therefore, I, Costas Vaticiotis, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Tarpon Springs, Florida, do hereby proclaim the month of November, 2023, as National Native American Heritage Month. Um, Mr. Morey, is uh, Mr. Rosa on? Mr. Rosa is not in attendance tonight. Okay, uh, we'll get this in the mail to him and, and I'm gonna go return my seat and then we'll go to public comments concerning this matter and then anything that the uh, commission might like to say. Are there any uh, commission comments concerning this proclamation? Any? Okay. Public comments, please. Mr. Delacus. Thank you. And I'd like to thank Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. 
like to thank the board for um, making this proclamation, but I want to remind the public of a few things. I know you see me come up here, I have these bookmarks, and I've been attached somehow in some way to the Indian culture for about 40 some years. And I think part of the reason I appreciate it is because they appreciated the earth. They lived off of what the land and what God provided to them. They took no more than they could use. What they did took, they used all of it. They predominantly really lived in peace. In fact, uh, we were up in uh, Cherokee, North Carolina and learning a little bit more about the culture there. And um, But if you study their history, uh, it's been a long struggle and we talk about diversity and I know the African American community has been subject to slavery and impoundment and indentureship and lack of rights. But the first ones who we put upon were the Native Americans. It was their land that was stolen and taken and they were subjected to go to Oklahoma or down into the Everglades. And if you really think about it, I've thought about this a couple of times. I believe all of y'all up there own your own house. And you got a title for it that says you bought it. And then they bought it and they bought it and they bought it. But where did that originally come from? So are you living on stolen property? Are you? Sometimes I think I am. But I want to bring one more thing into it as I talked about how they honored the earth. They sought ways to live amongst themselves in peace. Uh, latest edition of the AARP bulletin has thing about super agers, about people who live extraordinary long lives and um, still are active. And there's a little thing here from William Shatner, 92, actor. His secret weapon is passion for the future. My concern is about my children and grandchildren and the life they will lead given what we know is happening. Traveling into space was a gigantic emotional experience. The truth of it is I felt great relief as I realized how many, so how many things are going extinct while you and I are talking. I saw the beauty of the world and the harshness of space and realized what we are doing to our earth is so ugly. What we are doing to our earth is so ugly. So I know we read these pieces about honoring and doing things in print. And as I've said before, you have the ability to take action. I sent y'all an email to get a status. When Mr. Trask was here, it was over about a year or something ago, we asked to have affected party status with Pasco County with regards to the Antelope River Park. Part of the reason Mr. Rosa has been contacted is because him and his group went on October 9th and did a ceremonial protest at the Anklo River Mounds, which is where they want to build that restaurant. We have affected party status. Do we know where we're at on that? Do we know where the county over there is at? Is anybody following up? Who would I talk to to know where the status is of this? But you can play a part. Right. Thank you. Um, are there any other public comments? Uh, this is on the American, on the National Native American Heritage Month proclamation. We'll go into public comments in a minute um, on any other matters. Oh, Upila, Pila Maya, and say happy Sheridan Murphy. My name's Sheridan Murphy. I live uh, at 8790 53rd Way, Pinellas Park, Florida. I am the state executive director for the American Indian Movement. Mr. Rosa is the chairman. He is currently uh, dealing with a burial site in Miami, so that's why he couldn't be here. And he didn't tell me about this till 4.30, so 
I apologize for not being here a little earlier. You know, it's good to have a proclamation and a month for Native people, but we have to understand the reality in America for Native people. You know, Native people are invisible in this country. We're less than one-tenth of one percent of the population. The Native people today have less than two-tenths of a percent of their original land base. But 10 of the 25 poorest counties in the United States are Indian reservations, including the Pine Ridge, South Dakota Reservation, which is the poorest place in North America, which means that, yes, Haitians have a higher standard of living in Haiti than people on Pine Ridge in the United States of America. And that reservation is one of nine in South Dakota. And I bring it up to bring up a point. Nine of the poorest reservations in the United States are in South Dakota. And the Lakota, 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 or Chete Sanquan, or uh, misnamed Sioux people, uh, won the longest court case in United States history. It's called the United States versus the Sioux Nation. And the Supreme Court ruled that the Sioux Nation, as they called it, had the rights to South Dakota, North Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Wyoming, half of Minnesota, most of Nebraska, and parts of Colorado. And the United States government, in response to that, <laughs> offered $1.5 million. And the uh, Lakota people, the poorest people in the United States, said, uh, you know, stick it where the sun don't shine. We want the Black Hills back, the Paasapa, our sacred lands. It's now up to $2.8 billion. And as of last year, the uh, vote of uh, the enrolled members of those nine reservations said, no, we want the Black Hills back. You can keep the money. So there's an inherent tie to the land. In Lakota, we have a phrase called matakoyase, which means all our relations. And I know some New Agers use it in kind of a hippy-dippy weatherman kind of way. But what it really means is when we buried our ancestors, we buried them without a casket, right? So their bones became the dirt, and that dirt nurtured the tree. Therefore, that tree was created by our ancestors. Therefore, I'm related to that tree. I'm related to the leaves, right? So there's that kind of a relationship and a mindset that I think that Americans forget. You know, when you go across anywhere, the world even, and you talk to Native people, whether they're the Hmong in Vietnam, the Lakota here, the Seminole, the Miccosukee, and you ask them what their name is in their language and how it translates, it almost always comes out to the human being. Some of them get snotty and say the real human beings or the really cool human beings or something, but it's always the human beings. And it's that relationship and that understanding of who they are that Americans lack because we identify ourselves as Americans. We've disconnected ourselves from our humanity. We've disconnected ourselves with our relationship with the cosmos and we don't understand it. As, this, uh, as a speaker before me mentioned, there's burial sites right up the river at Anklot. And there isn't even a second thought, we're gonna put a snack bar on top of them. There isn't even a consideration. Would you put a snack bar on your grandma? I mean, really, think about it. You know, in Miami, they're building two monumental skyscrapers on top of burial mounds across from the Miami Circle. They liked that. They thought that was cool, but they're going to dig up the burial sites. Right now in Florida, we have four of those going on. Right now in Florida, we have a lady that ran an antique shop that had two skulls, native skulls, that she knew were native skulls that were given to her from a storage facility. And she put them on for sale for $4,000. Imagine them doing that to any other people. There's laws in the state of Florida. That guy's sworn to uphold, and the Lee County Sheriff's Office didn't do it. They didn't arrest the woman that had those. You know, there's laws that protect them. We have an unmarked burial law here in Florida that the state has refused consistently to prosecute. In order to respect the living, you have to respect what came before. And there's no respect for the ancestors here in the United States, for indigenous peoples. I appreciate the proclamation, but there needs to be more behind that than words, right? I mean, right now, throughout the United States, they're still doing sonar tests at 328 boarding schools where native kids were murdered 
because they spoke their language. And if you and that started in the 1880s, but it went on to the 1970s, man. And they're just starting to find those kids from uh, Carlisle to Holy Rosary, wherever it is, are. And they're just now starting to dig them up. And they're kids that went to school and never came home. They died because they spoke their language. They died because they wanted to be with mommy and daddy. They died because they wanted them to keep their hair long. You know, my dad got his mouth washed out by Carlisle because he spoke language, right? So we have to understand this reality when we have these proclamations. And it goes on and on. And I don't know how much time I have. What do I got down to 14 seconds? So <laughs> in the last 14 seconds, you know, I appreciate the proclamation. I think it's a good thing. And I think more people need to recognize the indigenous peoples of this hemisphere. But there has to be more than just those words. There has to be some actions behind it, or those words have no meaning. Thank you, sir. No, we don't do that. Uh, this at this, you know, in, a, in other words, additional two minutes, is that what you're trying to do? We don't do that in this part of the meeting. It's during the regular agenda. Uh, Ms. Dr. Bukovalis. Uh, Dina Bukovalis, 115 Athens oh, Street. By the way, thank you for your comments. Uh, sorry, Ms. Not, Dr. Not to Bukovalis. diminish in any way the work of AIM, which has been extremely important in um, sustaining and promoting, uh, preserving Native American um, culture and rights in this country. But we, we do have a resident of Tarpon Springs, whom you all know, Concepcion Tharan, who's um, an indigenous Maya who lives here with her children. Her first language was Maya. And maybe you want, might want to think in the future when you have a proclamation you know, of, of having her as a resident receive it. And then also not far away, we have a, some, the, you know, the, it's actually part of the Seminole Reservation in Tampa. And there might be people also from the Seminole tribe who might be able to come over, just, just to let you know. Thank you, Dr. Bukovalos. Are there any other public comments concerning this proclamation? David Ballard Geddes, uh, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. The, the Declaration of Independence labels the Indians as savages. I feel as though the Declaration of Independence in some way wasn't talking about the indigenous Indians of this land. In hindsight, um, I find the indigenous Indians of this land um, to uh, have been uh, very peaceful and modest people. The Constitution in Article I, Section 2, and the 14th Amendment has a clause in there where the Indians are tax-free. I find that the indigenous Indians of this land were taxed. There's a, uh, in, in, in statute law, I, I find a clause that frequently repeats itself as a, a federally recognized uh, Indian tribe. In some ways, I feel as though the indigenous Indians have been uh, disregarded in that, uh, that uh, recognition and have been disrespected for 246 years. I feel as though the indigenous Indians of this land have been beaten and starved and scalped and thrown onto reservations and today slowly die on reservations, mostly addicted to alcohol and, and drugs that have been pumped onto the reservation for decades. I feel as though the indigenous people need to be respected. And I feel as though, as the Hawaiians as well, need to have a respected seat in government. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other public comments from anyone in attendance here? Um, Mr. Morey, are there any public comments? Mr. Posh, did you want to say something? Yes. Um, oh, we're going to get to the regular public comments. Thank you. Um, we're just going to do finish up with the public comments on the um, on the proclamation. And uh, Mr. Morey, are there any other Zoom or remote access uh, comments concerning this proclamation? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. We don't have anyone. We have one, okay. Zoom attendee, you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. 
Chris Roboski, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Urban Springs, 34689. First, I'd like to thank Peter Delacos for bringing this forward. And I would especially like to thank Sheridan Murphy for all you do. You won't remember meeting me about 20 some odd years ago with Bill Reed and Clay Colson. I was the guy in the suit. We were off to another protest somewhere and uh, I had the pleasure of meeting you, finding out about the American Indian movement. And you're right, there's gotta be more done than a proclamation. Uh, we gotta do a lot. Let's get together and talk. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, are, are there any other uh, comments? Mr. Morey, remote access comments. If anyone else would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We do not have any more raised hands right. at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to regular public comments on anything that's not on the agenda. Gary Posh, 1140 South Point Alexis Drive. Good evening. Of all the old TV shows, the original Star Trek is almost peerless. My favorite episode is when the Enterprise happens upon a parallel universe where ancient Rome never fell. So you have a modern landscape surrounded by ancient Roman traditions. This brings about such things as televised gladiator battles. It's a great concept that's not lost on modern day Tarpon Springs. You see, in ancient Rome, when a messenger brought bad news, they destroyed that messenger. Does that sound familiar? Two months ago, the Tarpon Springs City Auditor presented a building department audit which showed conclusively that the department director was, in fact, a no-show job. We all know that favors such as this do not come gratis. Any strings attached here? Great question. Now, you can say it's none of your business what, a what arrangements were made. To that, I say, are you kidding me? This is the very textbook definition of small town corruption. It's cronyism in its purest form. Everyone on that dais knows all about this, but some are saying, let's just put this behind us. One commissioner even sat there and told us that the director in question, whom I'll refer to as Mr. P, was given an employment extension because the city, quote, needed his license, unquote, to function. We now know that was a blatant lie. They keep telling us there's nothing to see here. So let's see exactly what nothing constitutes. And these numbers are all public information. In six neighboring counties, it was revealed that the LLC owned by Mr. P had done a total of 726 outside projects in 2022 and 23. When one thinks of moonlighting, you may think of picking up an extra shift here and there to make ends meet. This is clearly and quite gallingly, nothing even close to that. I'll play around with that figure for a second. 726 outside jobs in only six counties. The sky's the limit what he did in the other 61 counties. But it gets better. While Mr. P was busy running his LLC, the city of Tarpon Springs paid a third party 25 grand in 2022 alone to do the work that we were paying him to do. That's 472 projects farmed out in 2022 alone. This is okay? Wait, there's more. Mr. P was also using the notary public services of Tarpon City employees to notarize his personal LLC documents. Now, why would a subordinate do this? It all gets back to what I pointed out last month. The city management style is that of bullying, fear, and intimidation. Now think about it. What sensible employee would not break the rules when asked by a director to do so? And this ain't water cooler gossip. I have paper to back up every word. It's just so damn insulting that they're doing this right in our faces and telling us to forget about it. Don't believe your lying eyes and ears. Believe what I'm telling you. Remember the old Tom and Jerry cartoons where they would keep sweeping dirt under the rug? We can't do that forever. After a while, that rug gets lumpy and eventually needs a cleansing. Let us please turn a page in Tarpon Springs 
So people are judged on the content of their character and what they have to offer the city, not what their connections are. Enough of this incessant deceit, it's wearing us out. Gentlemen, you have it in your power to turn that page because there's only two places in the entire universe where such behavior is tolerated. One is Tarpon Springs, and two is the Twilight Zone. Thank you. There are any other public comments? Tina Bukovalis, 115 Athens Street, um, and I'd like to um, discuss a couple things about the Greektown placemaking uh, project and the meeting that took place on October 18th. Uh, I think most of the commissioners were there. Um, according to Connect Tarpon Springs, the Greektown placemaking project purpose is to develop a resident-driven vision plan to enhance the Greektown historic district's historic and cultural character, provide guidelines for sustainable historic preservation, preserve and enhance the working waterfront, develop functional and vibrant public spaces, and promote sustainable economic development. And uh, to recap, this community-driven project was initiated uh, with the city by the Greektown Preservation and Heritage Association. So on October 18th, we had the first public meeting about the project. Unfortunately, some of the foundational explanations about the Greektown Historic District and the project purpose were limited. And comments by a few people revealed that they did not fully understand the intent or foundations of the project. So I want to address uh, some of those misunderstandings. In 2013, I worked closely with staff at the National Register of Historic Preservation and with Florida's State Historic Preservation Officer to nominate Greektown as a historic district with an overlay of traditional culture or a traditional cultural property. It fulfills all regular National Register criteria as a historic district, but each contributing resource had to um, be associated with some aspect of traditional culture. The Greektown District was listed for its association with Greek culture and commercial fishing or sponging. To formulate the nomination, I had to determine district boundaries, document the history and continuation of traditional culture, and relate the culture to practices at the specific sites in a residential and commercial district of about 400 resources. I formed a working group composed of residents and people raised in the district to help me pinpoint the current boundaries um, and I also lived in the district. Several walked the entire district with me while describing its history, the movement of people within it, changes of boundaries, lives of residents, and structures that no longer existed. This information, combined with National Register guidelines, led to the inclusion of areas that showed the greatest continuity of use and value, while excluding those that did not currently function as part of the district, as per National Register guidelines delineated in National Park Service Bulletin Number 38, published in 1990. For example, homes or businesses in the district were not considered contributing resources if they were not known for Greek culture or commercial fishing and sponging. For example, the city marina or the Terrapani residence, because that was mentioned. <clears throat> now, some considered it at the meeting problematic because there is a small area of several streets where the Greek town historic district overlaps with the downtown historic district. Well, both the National Register and the Florida Historic Preservation Review Board um, approved this, and I don't see any problem. We seek to create some protections for the Greektown District to avoid inappropriate building or renovation that does not align with district architectural traditions, although but the protections that we seek are not as stringent as those in the Downtown Historic District I see no problem if those streets that overlap the downtown district remain within um, the existing downtown guidelines. We, um, Dr. Bukovalas, we don't do the additional two minutes of oh, public comments. Okay. Do you, can you wrap up your thoughts in a few seconds? Um, 
anyway, any protection is good protection. I think, uh, I think what we might want to see here going forward, though, is a little more um, emphasis of both the consultant and the staff working with the community uh, who do have some expertise in these areas in order for this to be better explained to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any, Mr. Geddes. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Published, published in 1972, Maloney's Water Code serves as the foundation for the Resource Act of 72, which serves as the further foundation for the chapter of 373 of the Florida State Statutes, which bases the legal framework for the Water District. Chapter 1, Section 13 of Maloney's Water Code states that Every person shall be subjected to an annual user surveillance fee for the use of water and failure, failing to pay such annual user surveillance fee shall constitute grounds to revoke a person's consumptive use permit, disallowing water to such persons. Maloney's Water Code, Chapter 5, Section 10, states that the powers of the Water Board shall have the right to enter our property, claiming eminent domain in Chapter 1, Section 23 of Maloney's Water Code. Soldiering us in our homes, Pinellas County Reclaimed Water Resolution 95286, Section 3K, makes reference to this water inspection of such to be done without notice, day or night, and we must submit to this inspection fee in order to maintain the privilege of having the opportunity to access the privilege of water. The Third Amendment states that no soldier shall be quartered in our home without the consent of the owner. Waylaying our consent, the reclaimed water variance application was used to capture our consent under the Third Amendment, tricking us into forfeiting our property rights. In effect, this occupation has claimed eminent domain of our property in statute 15303 section 5 taking all lands all of our rights in statute 170.03 claiming rights to take our liberty property and life of christianity as so called due process under the 14th amendment to include our labor enslaving us in Federalist Paper Number 54, while so-called naturalizing water jurisdictions, calling us dogs in Federalist Paper 11. Abusive in its nature, I find the hypocrisy of our current Constitution, Hamilton's first Constitution, I feel is a bill of attainder. It's being used as a medium, as a letter of marquee, as a medieval act of reprisal, and is expressly prohibited from doing such things in Article 1, Section 9 and 10 of our current Constitution, which is in hypocrisy in and of itself regarding the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other public comments of anyone in attendance? Here to lack is 514 Ashland Avenue. Um, first off, <clears throat> sometimes we all find it hard to admit when we're wrong or have misspoken. So since I misspoke publicly, I'll correct myself publicly. At the last meeting on item 12 with regards to the ratification of the resolution with regards to the times, I made a comment that the Times reporting would be subject to either influence by what ads would be placed or other revenue sources. And I have to say, I take those statements back. That's incorrect. I was just in a moment of passion uh, because I know run by the Pointer Institute and from having read their paper for years and having met many of the journalists, uh, they all work with integrity in trying to put out the facts. So uh, I sent y'all some stuff about 
the Live Local Act. Uh, there is an article in the Business Observer, I'll be real quick. And uh, the act mandates that local governments authorize the development of multifamily rent rentals on sites that are zoned as mixed use, residential, commercial, or industrial for at least 40% of the residential units in a proposed multifamily development will be for a period of at least 30 years be affordable to individuals making up to 100, blah, 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 blah. All right. In other words, four out of 10 apartments have to be reserved. It also orders municipalities to apply the highest allowed density for multi-proposed multifamily family developments. And here's the interesting, these two rules are meant to eliminate one of the biggest hurdles cities, counties, and developers face when trying to increase affordable housing in, in communities. What do they say? Neighborhoods, that's pesky, pesky neighbors. The law allows localities to move forward projects while skipping the loud and sometimes disruptive public meetings that hold up or sometimes kill projects. There you go. And who pays for that? We do, through ship loans, credits, and sales. So y'all should know about that. Now, for my reading today, it's Genesis 18, and I'm going to start at 20 and hopefully can get to 33 by the end. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then, they Abraham, then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you, will not the judge of all earth do right? And the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And then Abraham spoke up again, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than the 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy it. Once again, he spoke to him. What if only 40 are found there? And God said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30. And Abraham said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? And he said, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, but may the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. All people who are innocent need to be spared. Okay, thank you. Are there any other public comments on anything that's not in the agenda? Mr. Morey, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. Okay. Zoom attendee, you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. Chris Probosky, 1602 Gold Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. I wanted to give you the most recent update on the Clay Colson case against the city of Tarpon Springs, which is now the Teresa Rubalcava case against the city to protect the 74 acres along the Anclo River, currently owned by Walmart, but will someday soon be a park. I know you've probably been told once again that the case is over, that the second DCA ruled. But Teresa has assured me she is going to appeal the case to the Florida Supreme Court. I would like to think that by now when you hear the case is over, you wouldn't believe it. But I'm here to remind you, this case will not stop. And we will not stop until the land is protected. And we could use some help. Please go to 
www.savedbourbonsprings.org and give whatever you can. And thank you for all the help that we've received. Have a good night. Good. We do not have any more raised hands at this time. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, we have no uh, emails for public records this evening, so <clears throat> I'm going to close our public comments and go to the, I'm sorry, was there someone else? I'm going to close our uh, public comments and go to the consent agenda. Um, is there any item that any of the commissioners wish to pull? Five? Uh, six. Six? six. Five and six? No, no, just six. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask for a, um, uh, I'm going to read the consent agenda. Uh, number one, attorney's fees, Johnson, Jackson, invoice 1111, I'm sorry, 11579. B, person, Cohen, Mooney, Fernandez, Jackson, invoices 4358 and 4359. C, Eunice Salzman, Jensen, PA, invoices 78301, uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, number two is the special events. A is the Thanksgiving Arts and Crafts Festival scheduled for November 25th and 26, 2023. B is Snow Place um, on December 1st. C is the Holiday Boat Parade December 1st. D is the Christmas Parade on December 9th. E is the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day Parade January 13th, 2024. Item three is renew file 190130, health benefits brokerage consultant services. Item four is award file number 240006, single source purchase of hockey equipment. Item five, award FRP number 230206, historic resources survey consultant services. Item seven is renew file number um, 200014, liquid carbon dioxide. Item eight is award file number 240033, tires and services Goodyear Auto Service Center. Item nine is review number, uh, review file number two, three, renew file number 230037, motor vehicle parts. Item 10 is increased to file number 230022, holiday lighting display. Item nine is increase file number 200095, audit services external. Um, those are the items that we do not have any that have been pulled by the commission. I'm gonna ask whether there's any public comments on any of these before I ask for a motion to approve. Peer to Lacks 514 Ashland Avenue, item one, attorney fees. So Mr. Posh over there mentioned some things with regards to the internal auditor and Johnson Jackson, our labor attorney. Uh, correspondence regarding audit report, review correspondence related to internal audit. Speak with Jane Kiffin, review correspondence from Billy, all this stuff going on there, more stuff on the back, conference with Ms. Regina Kardash, Review correspondence, blah, blah, blah. Something in here also, some about a memo. So I guess somewhere along the line, we're gonna get some kind of answer because the attorney bills seem to give us a clue that there's still a lot more going on. So hopefully that's soon. Now, uh, Ms. Kardash, I do have to say, I appreciate your billing. <laughs> it's very descriptive, uh, but I did have one question on October 2nd. Uh, there's an administrative fee for $1,200. And I didn't see anything at the end. Uh, expenses, I don't know if that's a Westlaw or what that has, but it says administrative fee and- Who, Whose invoice was that, Mr. Delacus? That. Who, whose invoice was that? Uh, that's the, you, let me. Mayor, that one's mine. Person is. Cohen, Mo yeah. Is that Ms. Kardash? Yes, okay, yes, Mayor. That's, that is mine, um, and that is charged monthly. Um, so there, that is on the bill every month, and it is for Westlaw and other things like copies and things like that. 
So yes. that's a flat standard fee yes. that was agreed upon in the Yes, original. it's okay. part of my contract. We're all cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other public comments on any of these things, these items? Okay, we have a motion to approve items uh, 1 through 11, less 6. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. Commissioner Kuhl, yes. Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, item six. Mayor, can, can I make a comment on one of those? Pardon me? Can I make a comment on one of those? On which one? Um, just a short thing on Christmas parade. Um, sure, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to make an announcement. I won't be around for the Christmas parade. So I uh, wanted to apologize. I'll be away on vacation. So that was pretty much it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Eisner. Um, item six, this is your item. Go ahead. <clears throat> Let me just go over to it. So my question is, we seem to always wind up getting increases from Stantec, and there's not really a reason in here except the comment I'm reading is the additional work consisted of additional interactive work sessions and adjustments to the financial planning mode and documentation of the updated results. I couldn't begin to explain that to anybody if I tried. What does that mean? Well, what basically happened was uh, all the things we're trying to go through with the water and sewer rate study, we had more meetings with them discussing all the different iterations and stuff. We went over the number of meetings that were within the scope of the contract, and that was the additional charges that they had. But this wasn't something that we requested. So I'm just always curious, um, and I'm just getting more and more concerned that every time we have a um, proposal from Stantec, the numbers change um, somewhere during it. And I, I think that when they give a proposal, they have to give a proposal anticipating all of the above. Not that it went into more meetings unless we as a city request that. Then I can understand why we're asking for it. Um, when it's written that, you know, they requested 10,000, we negotiated to five, sounds good on paper, but I don't want to pay the five. Um, I, I think that when you make a bid, you hold to the bid. Some bids you win some, some bids you lose some. Um, I just want to go on record stating that I'm not going to be approving 5,000 here and 10,000 here after, un unless it's something the city is, is approving, you know, beforehand. I don't want Stantec, unless they have a really good reason for why, um, why they need to have more money. I, and that's the way I'm going to leave it, okay? But thank you for your input. Okay. <laughs> um, I, just clarification, this is for the existing contract this year. Is they're asking for additional funds for the additional work. Yes, we had the okay. full rate study this year. and that, Yes, they're asking and, for and additional funds for this, this one this year. Right, in the, um, your memorandum, I think it was up around 10,000 or so, and, and it was negotiated down? Correct. Okay, so it, it I, I, maybe I misunderstood. This is for, you're, you weren't talking about next year's. You're talking about this year's. I'm, I'm talking about this 10,100 reduced down to 5,000. Right, for the existing contract this past year. Um, I didn't really look to see when this was. Yeah, I'm it just... was, in other words, this year when they did the um, rate study, they did additional work that needed to be done to come back to us with our recommendations, not for anything that they'll be doing for next year or the year after. Okay. Now that's correct. Well, is that right? It, does, it okay. doesn't state in here what was done. I, I understand that too. And uh, that's why I'm bringing this up. Right. Because every time we get a Stantec, it's 5,000, 5,000. And it just seems to be like they're going to put a bid out there and then change this up the bid afterwards. So I just want to go and say, now I understand, I'll go along with this, but I'd like to see this have a bid from the beginning and end it. 
unless there's something we're asking for that's outside the scope. I, I think that you will have notes as far as what the $10,000 was for, what they were asking for. That was not part of the uh, backup, if I'm not mistaken. So Mr. You, if you could provide that to Commissioner Eisner, that might be helpful. And, and, and well, correct. They had in the backup the number of additional hours that they did with because of our additional meetings that we had requested and stuff. Right. And we did request. We were the ones who requested. I know the that, that's meetings. the other part of it. it wasn't right. that, it wasn't the them? Part. It was us requesting them. Right. But see, that's the question I'm asking. Who is doing the request? Is it that they just want five more thousand dollars, or we went into it with more depth, and we should be responsible for that? It's not written here. Sure. That's it. I'm well, part, part of it is we requested more meetings, but then in discussion with Stantec, I said, you didn't tell us you were going over. That's part of what I came back to him and said, okay, you know, let's go 50-50 on this. You didn't tell us we were going over our limit. Uh, in the future, yes. City staff will be told, too, that, okay, this is the number of meetings we have. We have to keep to it and stuff. So Stantec was, you know, failed to tell us what our limit was, and we were asking for the additional meetings, and we went over that. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Are, there, are there any other, uh, are there any public comments concerning this item? Uh, Mr. Morey, are there any public comments for this particular item, the Stantec contract increasing the file number for the additional five or $6,000? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. Okay. Yeah, Zoom attendee, question. you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. Sharon Lander, 45 West, MLK Junior Drive, Tarpon Springs, Florida. I totally agree with Commissioner Iser's uh, questions. I, I'm really confused. Um, so I, I would, I would like to commend him for questioning this and I would like further explanation of these additional charges. So thank you. Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Landrum. Um, are there any other, uh, remote access comments, Mr. Moore? We do not have any more raised hands at this time. Uh, Vice Mayor Lund. Um Yeah, I just wanted to note that within the body of their contract, they're allowed to, uh, to expand their compensation, but it's supposed to be in writing and in advance. Um, whether it's lump sum or whether it's time charges, et cetera, was that adhered to in this particular case? Uh, no, they, they went over the number of meetings. You know, we requested meetings. We went over the number of meetings. We didn't know the limit of the amount of meetings. So they, you know, like they didn't tell us. That's why I went back and said, hey, I don't want to pay 10,000 bucks. And I said, okay, we do know what you did to put a lot of work into it and stuff and helping us out. So I said, okay, let's see if we can go 50-50 on this. Yeah, I understand they put a, a lot more work in this case, but in the future, they have a contract. I'm going to make them stick to that contract. So if the compensation says, you tell us in advance, whether it's lump sum or time or, or, or whatever charges, and that has to be approved in writing, and that's what it says in the contract, that's what I'm gonna to expect to see. Thank yeah, you. that was our discussion when it said, okay, how much is in our next study? What's our limit on the meetings? I, that's it. L <laughs> let me ask, uh, is there any interest of deferring this to get additional information for the residents as well? I, I don't have an issue with that. I don't think this is time sensitive. Is that correct, uh, City Manager McCorris? It's not time sensitive, but I don't know what else. <laughs> I don't think there's well, anything I, else we can I, bring I, you. I, I think along the lines, maybe a little more documentation. I, that's what I'm hearing, and I, I don't, I, I don't have an issue with it. I don't think it's going to... I don't really have an issue with it either, and I know we okay. spent a lot more time doing the rate studies right. and stuff like that, but there's contracts, and there's reasons for contracts, and discussions like this that take up time on the dais are because contract methods aren't being followed, and I, for one, am not a big fan of I agree with you on that one. <laughs> so um, are there any other commission comments? May I have a motion to approve item six? And a second? So moved. Second? Second. Uh, if there's no further comments, roll call, please, Ms. Jacobs. 
Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vedicators? Uh, yes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start on the special consent agenda, and we've got five minutes. So item 12, renew file number 220001, maintenance of public restrooms at the sponge exchange. City Manager Coolers. Yes, Janina, you want to come forward, and uh, this is one of your favorite items. <laughs> and this should be fast. Uh. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor, Board of Commissioners, Janina Lewis, Procurement Services Director. Uh, what you have before you with the public restrooms at the Sponge Exchange is just the renewal for the next year for the contract. In the base agreement, it is um, stated that the Board of Commissioners has to approve the renewal every year. So now we're bringing that back to you for the next fiscal year. All right. and, and I think the recommendations is based on them doing a, a very good job as far as keeping the bathrooms clean and open. Yes. Okay. Um, public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? Mr. Morey, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We do not have any raised hands at this time. Are there any um, um, commission comments on this item? Commissioner Eisner. So was this 7,500 um, the number that's been all along? Because when I look back into the backup, there were, um, you know, because we had so many starts and stops and we, we, we uh, it just nothing ever added up to 7,500. So. I was just, it was just a question to ask. The annual amount is 7,500. It's okay. roughly, I think it's $625 a month we pay them. Okay. Yeah, because when I tried to look it up, you know, we, we did it from four months and then we gave them three months. And then, you know, so when I was looking at it, I, I just couldn't figure out whether it was 7,500 or whether it was went up or went down. That's all. No, it'll be 7,500 from uh, the December to December timeframe. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Are there any comments? Yes, I, I'd like to uh, thank the property owners for working with the city of Tarpon Springs. They provide a, a public restroom that's in the, the middle section of the sponge docks and the Deaconies, and uh, working with them is a really good thing for the tourists and everybody down in uh, the, those public areas down at the sponge dock. So it's really appreciated, and, and thank you all for working diligently to uh, do those upgrades and, and working with us again. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments? The, um, I, I just want to say, I, it, it, I'm speaking to you, but it's really for the Kokino, Kokinos family that owns it. They've done a terrific job on the remodeling. I know they, they had to kind of buy their time, be patient to get it done, but it was done. And, and I appreciate the commission working in that regard to that end and being patient as well. So I, I think it all ends, all's well that ends well in this particular case. So we have a motion to approve and a uh, second, please. So move. Sir, second. Okay, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, we're not going to go on to the next item. I've got an announcement to make, and, and uh, I, we just have a couple of minutes also if there's any commissioners that want to weigh in on this. Uh, Ms. Jacobs, um, our city clerk, provided me the unofficial results of our referendum that is on the one point uh, eight acres um, at the sponge docks and the unofficial results which are in this particular case I, I don't see how they're going to change the yes vote was 2,339 and the no vote was 992 and that was about 70 percent yes about 30 percent no uh, we had uh, 3,300 turnout, which I believe is 19 to 20% of our, um, uh, our uh, voters that we have in Tarpon Springs. So I thought that was a pre good, pretty good vote uh, turnout. And also, Ms. Jacobs told me that this was, um, as far as Pinellas County, this was um, the only one that had, Tarpon Springs was the only one that actually had an election. All the other ones uh, had run unopposed. So there were no elections. We were the only item that people actually had to turn out and vote on in Pinellas County. So uh, the people have spoken. I'm always very appreciative of that. And um, 
Uh, and let me ask any commissioners, do any of you have any questions or comments that you'd like to make on this? I voted. You voted, yes. <laughs> now, now the residents have spoken, and I think it's uh, time for staff or us to start putting it together what, what our intentions are with that property and, and try to utilize it in the best way to make it that community event or area space that we've talked about in so many different ways. So it's a good right. thing for the sponge docks, a great thing for the merchants down there and uh, overall for community engagement, enthusiasm. I think uh, if we get it all right, it's, uh, it's gonna work out. So thank well, you. We, we, we're gonna have to close first and actually purchase the property. <laughs> And uh, Mr. LaCourse is going to be counting his uh, money out of the piggy bank to make sure that happens. So, <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Herring as well, if he's still there, is going to have to move some money around, I believe. Um, and in any case... He, he's um, in the back cack counting yeah. money now. <laughs> <laughs> He'll put his green transparent plastic visor on. Um, okay, so let's uh, do the ordinance and resolutions um, item. There's only one. The other one was deferred. It's um, item 24. Ordinance 2023-22, water and sewer rate. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Kardash, if you could read the ordinance by title, please. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Ordinance number 2023-22, an ordinance of the City of Tarpon Springs, Florida, amending portions of Chapter 20 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Tarpon Springs, increasing the water rates for fiscal year 2024, December 1st, 2023, through September 30th, 2024, and fiscal year 25, October 1st, 2024 through September 30th, 2025, increasing the sewer rates for fiscal year 24, December 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2024, and fiscal year 25, October 1st, 2024 through September 30th, 2025, increasing the reclaimed water rates for fiscal year 2024, December 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2024, and fiscal year 25, October 1st, 2024 through September 30th, 2025, and providing for an effective date. This is second and final reading. This item was advertised in the Tampa Bay Times on October 18th. Thank you, Ms. Kardash. Um, are there any public comments on this matter? Um, I'm sorry, there were any new information from staff? Um, Mr. Smith? I, I think we're pretty much here ready to answer questions or anything that comes up. Okay, are there any public comments on this item? Peter Lax, 514 Ashland Avenue. Okay. Uh, on page two, where it talks about base facility charge for residential individual meters, all meter sizes, customer charge 402, readiness to serve charge 1871, total base charge 2273. Why, if we're actively getting service do we need to be paying for a readiness to serve charge that would be like if you're on vacation and you're not using water you're they're keeping your abode ready to serve that was my first concern now secondly the next block uh, gallonage charge and these blocks are all in 5,000 increments I'm not sure from staff or from the studies that why it's in 5,000 increments. I would think it would be wise to change it to encourage some conservation to have a lower first block from zero basically to 2,500 gallons. And then from 25, maybe the 75, but then once you start going over 10,000 gallons, I mean, 10,000 gallons a month? There's, you, anything over 10,000 gallons, you need to be raising these prices. You need to be raising those prices. They're, they're, anybody using that much water needs to be paying a lot more. And then as far as in, um, the sewer section, I don't have sewer, but for those, uh, it says all meter sizes 220, 1588, 1808 total base facility charge. And my question there was, if we treat water in and water out going the same, 
why are those base facility customer charges different than the one in the uh, water section? So it was just a few things that perked up on my radar as to uh, some things in there that might need to be looked at or adjusted, especially the, the, the blocks of water use, because if there's no encouragement to save water, then, oh, I can use 5,000 and still get charged the same amount. There's no incentive to try to save and find ways, you know, to conserve. And that helps us all in reducing the stress on our water system that we then don't maybe have to replace the filters as much. So it all does have a trickle down effect through the system. Thank you. David Ballard Geddes Jr., Georgia Avenue, Palm Harbor. About 14 years ago, I, I received a Pinellas County utility water bill. About 14 years ago, Pinellas County decided to have a private public partnership with a third party facility and took that third party facility and compacted it on my utility bill, claiming it to be a utility ready to serve charge based on statute 15311 that reclaimed water availability fee is a bond yield so in effect it's a water tax the supreme court case 96332 ratifying the reclaimed water bonds is entirely defective on every measure it's legal garbage they tore up every street in the county putting down reclaimed water pipes and deliberately neglected the essential water lines at that point to leading to my house were 65 years old and needed dire replacement, deliberately neglecting that form of infrastructure. So I balked and said, I am not paying your $14 availability fee and I don't wanna live in your contrived reclaimed water ready to serve zone. They said, well, Mr. Geddes, we're gonna foreclose on your house and turn off your water. And I said, okay, we've got a problem. And here I stand before you 14 years later. Um, these water issues are by no mistake. Development in this town has been some of the most rapid, uncontrolled development in the history of the world. And um, I feel as though some of these development practices were used deliberately as a way of exhausting our vital water supply, deliberately eating us out of our subsistence as written in the Declaration of Independence, intent on controlling the will of man in Federalist Paper 79, um, using water as its weapon of choice, Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution. I feel as though this reclaimed water ready to serve zone of such is a challengeable um, uh, charge. I think this facility needs to stand on its own. I don't believe that they should compact the utility with this private public partnership. This facility is up to uh, unsovereign uh, um, behaviors and is unbecoming um, of a sound system of government. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Uh, Mr. Morey, are there any remote access comments concerning the water and sewer rates? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. Okay. Zoom attendee, you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Sharon Landrum, 45 West MLK Junior Drive, Tarpon Springs. I would like to uh, agree with Peter DeLapas about his views on the water rights. I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. So I, I would like to just concur with his views and agree. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Landrum. Mr. Morey, anyone else? We do not have any more raised hands at this time. Okay, let's go to commission comments. Uh, Commissioner Eisner, you've got your light on. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I did listen to what Mr. Delaca said, so I quickly ran some numbers just to give people a better perspective. Um, 
not including the total base. If you use the maximum amount in block one, it's $21.40. If you use it in block two, which is 10,000, it's 8560. So that starts to make it a deterrent. If you go into 15,000, it's gonna be 160.80, which again, that's double the amount, yet you're not using double the amount. So again, this is a deterrent. I mean, these can be tailored a little bit. When you go into block four, it's 268.60. Um, then it goes into $417. And then it goes into $522. I don't know if anybody does more than 25,000 gallons. Um, I guess after that, they just cut your line and don't let you live in tarpon. But um, these are deterrents. The only thing I would like to see if, if people abuse the system month after month, that we might want to put a penalty on it because you know, um, it, it kind of condones people that have the money to just say, I, I don't care what it costs. So that might be a, a venue to stop people from um, wasting water because they can afford to do it. That's the only other thing that I would like to see put in. Because I do agree that, you know, we all should be at the uh, conserving portion, not just uh, I could afford more, so I'll just let my water run. Uh, we all should be doing our part. But I think these are a deterrent, and, and I think that's how you set this up. This was not done nilly-willy um, numbers. So I hope that explains um, the numbers that are out there. They, I, I, I think they're okay, um, but that's what I want to say. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments? Okay, sir, uh, Commissioner Koulianis, did you have something on this one? Do yeah. you have a comment? We, we're talking about the proposal, right? On the, the water and sewer rates. Water rates, yes. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, can you put up on, uh, do you have the, are you putting it up on the screen? Are we at this point now where we can comment on the sure. presentation? Okay. So, um, Go to the, uh, the chart, uh, comparison of proposed plan with original plan. It's page 20 of the slides. Okay. So just, I think this is important that the, the citizens understand this, that um, one of the prior boards um, reduced rates. And um, if you look at the line, the 2019 plan had uh, us going on a straight line of uh, cost of living increases, correct? Okay. So had we stayed on that, um, on that plan, we would be at the same point we're at now with the 2023 proposal to get us back to that point. So let me ask you, um, and I'm not, this is, I'm not condemning any of the prior boards because nobody understood, you know, none of them had a crystal ball. None of them knew that, you know, we had this inflationary uh, stuff coming and I thought, you know, I'm sure they did what they thought was the best for the city. But um, so if you, if we had have been on the same trajectory of modest increases, what would the increase have been this year? I believe it's the uh, approved rate plan in 2019 was 2.75% inflationary increases each year. Okay, so the, the rate increase, instead of having to be 9.95, would be 2.7? 2.75, correct. 2.75. Mm -hmm. So again, we're doing, this board is cleaning up and doing catch up for a, a drop in rates in prior year, correct? Well, we do have to come back up to where the uh, expenses are. And right. I will say when that was approved, it was shortly after 
the um, economy inflation, we have some charts in the same yeah. presentation that spiked. Yeah, and, I, and again, I'm not condemning the board. I, I, I'm sure they did what they thought was best, and any chance that a board can have to uh, give relief to the citizens, you know, I, you can't condemn them for that. But that, but again, without a crystal ball, things happened that were unforeseen, and now we're at this point where we're having to do this dramatic raise. But had we been on the 19 plan, this raise would have only been 2.75% which would have been a modest under the actual uh, cost of living uh, percentage of inflation that we have this year. Just want to make that clear so that people understand that we're, we're not raising at 9.95 because it's something we want to do. It's something we're kind of stuck doing. So thank you. Uh, the only thing I want to say is I don't own a crystal ball, but we need to be careful next year there may be another seven or eight percent increase um, because of the extraordinary situation we've got with material costs so um, I, I just want to make it clear that um, for the record for this evening we're, you're correct but next year we could be facing something similar as well even though we're on the curve of the 2019 curve so yeah I hope not either so um, if there are any other Commission comments um, may I have a motion to approve uh, the second reading of this ordinance? And no moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kulias? No. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Van Yes. Yes. Okay. That's the end of the ordinances. Let's go back to the, you want to take a break? Yes, uh, why don't we adjourn for uh, 10 minutes. We'll reconvene at 8, uh, 7.57.
Oh, we're going to reconvene the meeting at 7.58. Um, item 14, uh, City Manager McCorris Award did Pitt Street Bush Avenue drainage and roadway improvements. Yes, uh, Bob, Bob Thank Robertson. You. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Go ahead. Bob. Good evening. I'm Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director. For this item, we're asking the board's approval to move forward. Whoops, wrong one. For this one, we're asking for the board to award a construction contract to Keystone Excavators in the amount of $4.599 million. This project consists of construction of stormwater ponds, stormwater pipes, potential water upgrades, uh, sorry, potable water upgrades, wastewater collection upgrades, landscaping and roadway repair in the Gross Avenue corridor between Tarpon Avenue and the Inclut River at Live Oak. Funding is provided from, from a number of sources, including water and sewer utility, stormwater utility, a swift mud grant, ARPA grant, and settlement funds from the default of the prior contractor. Uh, Mr. Mayor, that concludes my staff report. Okay. Um, are there any public comments concerning this item? Um, Mr. Mori, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, Commissioner comments. Um, Commissioner Eisner, you've got your light on. Thank you, Mayor. So my first comment is, aren't we rushing into this? Didn't we wait long? I'm just kidding with that. that <laughs> um, <laughs> what, I, what I did want to ask is what we spoke about earlier. Um, so it's not a surprise to you that I'm going to ask you the question. Um, what is the difference in price from what we're paying now to what was allotted and still out there to be utilized for this? The difference of how much more it's going to cost us is, is what I'm looking for. So the amount of work completed is roughly 1.8 million so you're adding in 4.6 million to complete the whole project so the total overall project cost is 6.4 million roughly so this 4.6 million is what takes us from the work that's already been completed to date which value which amount, the amount of money we paid matches the amount of work that has been done and takes us from that point to the finish line so it's not that we're spending 5 million or 6 million dollars correct at this point correct okay I just wanted to make that clarification because there are people that don't know and when they see a number like this um, just looking for a clarification so sure thank you appreciate that thank you vice mayor Lund. Uh, yeah I have a couple of comments um, so from my understanding the original contractor who didn't work out for us finished about 40 percent of their work yes sir yeah the bond company didn't reimburse us for 60% of what the amount was. Is that a, there a specific reason for that? It's just what the negotiated negotiation landed on. So we were about, we had needed 1.4 million that was left in the value of the contract. The settlement was 1.05 million. Yeah, so mental, con, mental calculations by me, that ends up, Somewhere along the line during this negotiation process with the bond company, we lost somewhere in, in the neighborhood of another $450,000. Yes. How did we allow that to happen? I, you know, the bond company is supposed to pay us for what hasn't been done, yet they ended up walking away with $465,000 of coverage that we now have to come up with. And from this perspective, it looks like it's additional ARPA funds, which are going to have to go with this, which again hits our bottom balance on the ARPA funds, reduces it from the 650 plus it is now down to, uh, I don't know, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 142. This is, I don't know, I really don't know how to phrase this up. This is not making me happy. The fact that the bond company is making us eat away at, at dollars that we could be using for other projects. I mean, and at the same time, I, I see, well, okay, we're going to use ARPA funds for the Alpha Spiral project. We've got other things that are, are trying to encumber ARPA funds. And, and 
I'm, I'm failing to see how our negotiations ended up costing us four hundred fifty thousand dollars. I, I think if you remember from the attorney when he gave the presentation, we could have fought for that four hundred fifty thousand dollars. We may have been in court for a year, two years. We may have got it. We may have split the difference. We might have delayed this thing further. I think when they made the presentation to you and this board made the decision on there, it was a combination of the time tied up in court and the expectations, because this, this board is the one who decided to take that settlement. But it's good reason, because we want to get this thing bid out and get it done for these poor people that we've impacted and the court fight and stuff that the bond company who has a lot of money to put up the court fight we may have won in the end but what was the total value of the amount of money we would have won at the end of it i think that's why yeah thanks your, i, I remember the conversation your ultimate decision now, was based on that um the chances um if, if later on the court got split in the middle and we did a year and a half fight for two hundred thousand or son was it really work impact in the price? So it was a tough decision that none of us liked, but the reality of the court system and how long they can tie that thing up, I think the attorney gave you the, the recommendation of what the reality was and you just bit the bullet. We all bit the bullet um, to try to get this, this project done for these people out here, so. So I, I yeah, then I, you know, I really empathize with the people that are having to put up with all this. Um, I think during the last conversation we had, there was a mention uh, by me of, of strengthening the bond contracts because of stuff like this. Uh, when we typically go into a situation uh, where we bid a project, do we supply the bond contract or does the, the, the bond contract come from the, come from the person that's bidding? So they choose their bond company. They say, this is what we're going to do. These are the contract terms of the bond. Is there any negotiation involved in that? That's not something I'm typically involved with. I don't know if Janina can comment on that, but. Well. Janina Lewis, Procurement mm -hmm. Services Director. Typically with the bond uh, information, it's a form, it's a standard form that the contractor fills out and they enter the basically the amounts and it's a, it's a standard agreement there's no like negotiating the terms in there why um that's just the standard language that we've had approved through the lawyers vice this. vice mayor if i if i may this is attorney regina kardash um typically that's how it works with bonds you tell the company um the amount of the bond and the amount of the bond is usually something that is sufficient to cover the entirety of the project and when they get it it's based on their credentials on the company that is getting the bond and it's actually their agreement where the city is a beneficiary of that agreement for these types of instances um, and so they are fairly standard, um, particularly in, in public construction contracts. Um, and there's not really a lot of negotiation. All you have, to, all the contractors usually have to do is supply proof that they have the bond and the amount that the bond is in, and and that's usually sufficient. Okay, so I, uh, yeah, I, I sort of understand that. Yeah. I, um, all right, I, I'm going to drop this conversation. I don't think that's the proper way to do these kind of things because it puts us in a situation when the bond company has to react that we're having to negotiate with something that should be a somewhat less negotiable. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm disappointed to see yet another close to $500,000 come out of ARPA for, for, for this. Um, but that's all I have to say. Okay, Commissioner Kulianich, you've got your light on. Um, yeah, Vice Mayor, I think we, uh, you, you jogged my memory too, I think. Didn't we, we voted on approving this negotiated amount, right? Back, I think it was, what I, it was like one of my first meetings, I think. Um, how, how often has this happened in our, in your tenure with the, the city? How often has a contractor defaulted? Yeah. One time. This is this it. one. Okay. So, uh, all right. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments? Oh. Yeah. That just, it was frustrating as it all happened. And then I feel for the residents and, you know, hearing their complaints that, that live over there. But it, like Commissioner Quillianis uh, brought up, it's 
very rare situation. Um, we're going to take hits from all sides, and then let's just get this project done for those residents. It's been a long time, and they they deserve to have a street where they can pull out and not have debris come into their yards. So thank you. Okay. Um, I, I have one question, um, it, and I don't have an issue with it, but it's basically information um, on the on this particular contract in order to come up with the money. I know uh, Vice Mayor Lunt uh, mentioned the uh, 450000 of ARPA, but uh, we also have that we're needing to take 470000 from the um, sponge docks flooding abatement uh, project specifically, and then the idea is to pay that back based on interest that we would get from the other ARPA money. Is there any kind of a time or schedule that we've got for when that would come back, uh, Ron. be paid back in total? I believe that's annual, but I'll let, I'll let Ron take that one. I mean, I don't have an issue with what we're no, doing. Right. I just want to know uh, when we start moving money around uh, exactly what the terms are. No, I'm calculating the amount of interest. We, we will be able to earn in fiscal year 24 on the balance. We will get that money back within fiscal year 2024. Within this next fiscal year coming up? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, are there any other commission comments? Um, and we've got public comments. All right. Does, may I have a motion to approve in a second, please? So moved. Is there a second from anyone? Commissioner Koulianis, you second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vaticiotis? Uh, yes. Um, I'm going to ask the um, board's indulgence if we could do item 16 before 15, and I have a, a reason for that. It's along the lines of what we just discussed. Um, I don't have an issue with either one of them, uh, but I just would like to talk about the project administration update. I do have some questions on that that may be germane to 15 before we decide on 15, and I do have a recommendation for that as well. Um, if there's no objections, I'd like to go ahead and do item 16 first. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Robertson. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm Bob Robertson, Project Administration Department Director. The, for those who don't know, the Project Administration Department is made up of four full-time staff members, including myself. And between the four of us, we're currently managing or monitoring 38 projects. Tonight, I'm going to highlight a few of those for you and uh, just leave plenty of time for questions on any active projects you may want to know about. So um, jumping right in, um, the Seabreeze Drive Sanitary Sewer Project is nearly complete. It's recently passed its electrical inspection. All pipes have been pressure tested and leak tested, and now we're just needing to test the lift station um, and get clearance from DEP to put the system into operation. My team is now updating the info packet that we'll be distributing to the residents so they know how to connect to the new system. Um, the Anklet River Extended Turning Basin dredging is underway. It's about 15% complete. Again, this is the city's portion of the dredge. Um, estimated completion on that is in January. Um, clerk's office construction is pro progressing in fits and starts, but uh, brickwork is set to resume tomorrow. I had a conversation with the contractor's vice president today, emphasizing the need to keep the project moving steadily forward. Um, so looking forward to that. And then finally, um, the last one I'll touch on is the Bayshore Drive septic to sewer project. This project goes to bid this week, um, I think this weekend, and bids will be due in December. So that's just a few highlights, and uh, Mayor, back to you for any questions about projects. Okay. Um, does does, let me go to the public first. Are there any public comments on, on this matter? This is the uh, project update and status. Mr. Morey, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. Zoom attendee, you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Peter Lack at 514 Ashland Avenue. Actually, I was on hold from the last item uh, with regards to the Fenton Grove Street. Thank you, Mayor, for bringing up the interest aspect. That was my concern. But also my other concern and how it ties to the water and sewer rates is the two encumbrances from the water and sewer fund and also from the stormwater fund and 
if all this shuffling money from the water and sewer fund to cover uh, this project and also money that's gone to the golf course and maybe some other projects that we don't remember that money has been encumbered. I wonder how much that affected the aspect of being able to go forward with any of the capital improvement projects that are planned under the water and sewer fund or under the stormwater utility fund because we keep seeming to borrow money and those numbers show up as digits on paper, but we're not seeing the after effects of those loans, interdepartmental loans, how it affects those departments the money are coming from. So those are my concerns. As far as the project administration department, those guys are working hard. You, we've got a lot of projects and I appreciate the work that Bob and Tom and all those guys over there do, Paul and everybody. So thank you. And uh, we're glad we have a good staff to keep you informed and up to date. And we appreciate that. Thank you. Good day. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other comments, Mr. Morey, from anyone? We do not have any more raised hands okay. at this time. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I've got some questions I have for Mr. Robertson. Um, on on the, um, just a real easy one, on the MLK intersection, um, I, you know, I'm a little concerned about how slow that's progressing. I think we were supposed to get under construction, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I thought originally August, but then I think it was September and now we're into uh, November, and I, and and I know we're still working on shop drawings, and and I don't know whatever else there was that delay of upside or changing to a different size diameter because one diameter. Um, I'm a little concerned that this is kind of reflective of what's going to happen when they actually get under construction and how it's tied to the Anclo River. Um, I'm sorry, the Beckett Bridge over by the Yacht Club. Has there been any update on that? That sure. Uh, two things I'll comment on that. First is uh, we had originally asked them to start in, in the November time frame. They wanted to start after hurricane season, so there wasn't any risk to inundation of the construction site. Um, and then we talked to them about that and said, well, let's not have any uh, inter traffic interruptions and shutdown during the holidays. Let's get past Epiphany. Gives them time to get all the materials stored, stockpiled, and ready to go. So when, then when we do shut down that intersection, it's blow and go, 60 days shut down, get it done, get in, get out. Um, and then your question about Beckett, um, I have a call with the county every couple of weeks. Latest update is they're still at best looking at late 2024 before they can start construction. Early 2024? Late 2024. May, May 2024. Yeah, so by the end of, of next year, more than a year away, possibly early 2025. So I, I think we still have plenty of fluff or float in our schedule. Don't, please don't say that. I just said I think. <laughs> I'm not promising, but right. if, we start, if we're starting this thing in January, I think we'll be fine. I, I really, yeah, I understand their rationale, but I hope it's not just being used as a, well, for whatever reason, they were tied up with some other project. <clears throat> we need to be real mindful that this is the intersection that's going to be the main route to uh, out from the west side of Tarp, uh, Tarpon Springs. We understand that very okay. well. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, the other one is the um, Helfer Spur. Um, I know that um, in order to make up the difference for that, we're, we're possibly going to be taking some money from the Bayshore Drive sewer project uh, to make up for the shortfall for that. And, um, and then and because there's some expectation that the Bayshore uh, Drive sewer project is going to come in less cheaper than what we had predicted as far as what the cost estimates are. <laughs> correct. And right now we're, um, we've completed the design. Is that correct? We're getting the, ready for the RFP and it's supposed to go out in early December. It's early December. So is there, is there any update for that of when it will actually go out to RFP? I just sent the materials to Janina today for that to go out to bid. Pardon me? Going out today. Bid, bids are going it, it went out, out this today? week. This week. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so we're really not going to know whether we've got any extra money um, until that bid comes back. Is that correct? Correct. I mean, I, I mean that's an obvious uh, answer to the question. Okay. The um, the Anclo River Dredge um, project. I know that um, it, it's kind of dragging, and I know not due to anybody's other than the contractors. You know that it's their process. Um, 
and, and I know that in, we, we were still paying for the disposal site. And, um, and I know that there was some discussion where we were gonna use our own crews and perhaps rent the uh, e ERP or the DEP trucks. In other words, the ones that don't leak to haul the material off of that to somewhere else, maybe over to the landfill or something. I'm not sure. I think that was the original plan. And then I think the game plan was changed to actually contract those services out. Is that correct? And then that was the second approach. And now then there was a third approach of figuring out a way to, and, and there was some conceptual idea of, of maybe doing it to where it wouldn't cost the city either any money or not a whole lot of money. Um, have we resolved that yet? Yeah, I'm working towards the third solution, which is to leave the materials on site, grade it down, um, it is uh, significantly cheaper to do that. We still do have to pay a severance fee to the DEP, but the numbers are something like 25% of the cost of trucking it off now. Back in the early days, like you were saying, trucking the material off was roughly the same cost as leaving it behind, but inflation has brought those numbers way up and the DEP severance, fact, uh, severance number has stayed the same. So um, I've worked out, um, I've got the plan, I've got the grading done. I'm submitting for an ERP modification so that I can do that. Um, the property owner is in agreement so far with the plan. Uh, he's reviewing it uh, to make sure it's compatible with his do, needs. Do we need a, we're gonna be changing the elevation of that property, yes, right? Is there any right. permitting that's gonna be required? Yes, and that's what I'm talking about. So the, when, when are we gonna get started on that? We've already started it. Oh, you've already started yeah. it, okay. Uh, those are the four items. Um, the, the point I wanted to make that there was still a couple of these um, unknowns as far as the amount of money that we need. I'm sure that's going to be the case with some of the other things that you didn't uh, list here, um, Lemon Street uh, project and stuff, as far as any unforeseen circumstances that we had, um, unforeseen conditions similar to what we had to Seabreeze. Hopefully not, but I think we already had one, right? Because, we did, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, let me ask, uh, if, are there any other, uh, Vice Mayor Lunch, you've got your light on. Why is I always on? Um, so I have a, just two um, comments here. Um, the Ancoat River Outer Cut Stretch, the last time we heard from uh, the Armored Corps of Engineers was in late February. Could we press them to see if they're going to get their act together and put a schedule on it? Um, I mean, I could check up on it myself, but I think we should do it as a city and, and say, hey, what's going on? Um, Certainly. The other thing I want to mention is the Elfersburg's recreational project. Uh, within the, the, the text here, uh, it says the concurrent bids approaches of both projects will be using ARPA funds. Uh, to my knowledge, Elfersburg's has never been asked for nor committed to ARPA funds. Um, so I don't like seeing stuff that, that says, this is my decision before the board gets to make a decision on that. I mean, yes, maybe Bayshore is not gonna hit its 1.3 or whatever we, we allocated to the Bayshore project. That does not necessarily mean whatever's left over we get to shift just as a matter of course over to another project. Um, do we even have an estimate on what the Elfers project is going to cost? Yes. The number is about 1.3 million. It's about 1.2 million, and it's going to be funded how? I'm just double checking. I'm pretty sure we had that in Elfers, uh, in the in ARPA. So, if I'm mistaken, Ron's coming in behind you, Mr. Roberts. Sneaking up on me. I mean, it's a local spur off the Pinellas Trail. I'm not sure if the county's going to contribute to this or not. I understand the issues that are at hand as far as as the bridge, et cetera. But I, I'm really not liking to see somebody say that, you know, it's going to use ARPA funds that haven't been asked and approved for. That's that's uh, currently for the Elfers per project. We have one million twenty thousand budgeted in the penny fund, one hundred eighty thousand budgeted in the rec impact fund, which totals one point two million. No ARPA fund, that's just such one. We have the 1.2 million budgeted currently. Okay, so we have penny funds and... and the bulk of it's penny fund, 1,020,000. The balance, 180,000, is in the recreation impact fund. Okay, so what was the allusion to ARPA budget for the... I think it was ARPA. 
where it said extra funds could be used to fund. It, I don't like to see that. I'm sorry. It's just a comment, but it's it's an assumption that I don't think should be made before the board has a chance to make that decision. Thank you. Understood. Um, Commissioner, uh, you're done, Vice Mayor Lund. You're done. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, thanks. Uh, Vice, I'm sorry, Commissioner Eisner. Thank you, Mayor. Um, since the MLK intersection project has taken more time, has anything been done with our conversation, at least the conversation I had with you, about adding drainage to the MLK area in the event of heavy rain while we have high tide and there's no drainage? So the project does include drainage. Um, not sure if you're talking about the, the pumping system that you had alluded to in previous conversations? Yes. Okay, so nothing has been added to that because uh, what you had asked for had come in after the project was awarded. So something like that would be uh, quite a bit more significant and a, a massive change to the project to, to do that. It could be something that get re gets retrofitted at a later date, but I believe what we're proposing um, will, will be a significant improvement over what's what we're seeing there because pr primarily we're raising the, the the elevation of the intersection so that we don't have the flooding. But raising the elevation over there stops the drainage uh, off of MLK in heavy rains. Correct? It stops the drainage. No, it doesn't stop the drainage. It it improves the drainage so that you it, don't have It'll the flooding. improve the drainage as long as it's low tide. If it's high tide, it's not going to drain towards the um, towards the bayou. So my question is, um, there is a number of um, drainage locations along MLK. It doesn't even have to be a pumping system. It could just be a, um, a grading with a lower, you know, drainage so it could drain off to the side. I see what you're saying. Yeah, the infrastructure is being installed right. as part of this project. Additional drainage. So there will be drainage off of MLK? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So it does, they're not looking to drain only to the bayou, correct? To the Whitcomb Bayou. Well, it, the whole system there at that intersection collects from MLK, just like you're saying, and it will continue to do that. Right, but is there any auxiliary drainage? Should there be high tide, and we have a, um, a high tide, a king tide, and we have a heavy rain on that same type day, because those are gonna happen, and what I'm trying to avoid is that MLK goes underwater and we can't drive through MLK or it goes into the people's homes. On the um, north side, there are water drainages that can just take that overflow. That's my question. Well, what you're asking me is, is more to do with the detailed hydraulic modeling, and that's not something I have at my fingertips that I can discuss with you. I would I would be happy to meet with you and talk to you about details and, and bring the engineer and show you the hydraulic grade line and how it works. I'm just not prepared to discuss that at the podium okay. tonight. Well, we because we do have time for this, and that I, even if it's not in the original bid, I mean, it could be something that we can add in. It's something we can look into. Okay. Sure. Is, is there, I mean, is there something that you want to request? I mean, you're... I'm, I'm going to have to meet with him. Okay. And, and you know, go ahead with this because, like I said, I, I do want to see that we don't have, um, you know, we could be solving one problem, making other um, flooding problems. So yeah. that's what I'm trying to This avoid. would be fair for something that uh, Commissioner Eisner could work with your city staff and yes. come up with something and present it to the yes. commission. Yes. Is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, comments. Uh, okay, uh, Comm Commissioner Quilianis, did you have anything? Okay. Um, as far as there is no action on this particular item, is that right? It's just a status report, or do you want something out of this? Um, just usually on special consent, since the way the format we have, just to approve the report and presentation. You want to pr approve yeah. it? Okay, may I have a motion to approve the presentation? So moved. Is there a second? <coughs> Second. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner Polianis? Yes. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay, item. Um, let me go 
go back to this item 15, the pickleball court design options um, presentation, right? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Robertson. Okay. Um, so for this item, we're asking the board's approval to move forward with the design of a new pickleball complex to be constructed at the South Parcel Fitness Park located on the south east corner of Live Oak and Safford Avenue. Um, this item was presented in a conceptual form at the September 19th BOC meeting. At that meeting, the board asked for additional information and confirmation that they wanted to know if up to four courts could really fit uh, at the pro proposed location with, along with some amenities. Um, I worked with DRMP, which is one of our engineers of record. They drafted up some conceptual site plans to scale that are included in your backup for four, three, and two court options, along with benches, sail shades, landscaping, and lighting amenities. So um, will four courts fit? Yes. Um, what about stormwater? The project would be exempt. Um, there's enough of a square footage minimization so that we don't cross the threshold to have to provide additional stormwater treatment. What is the cost? Um, I put those numbers in your backup. For two courts, construction cost with amenities, all the bells and whistles is 259,000. Three courts is 371,000. And four courts is 470,000. And, um, and I'll mention that, that that is with all the amenities, that's the deluxe version. We, we can phase some of that in or there's some alternatives for uh, procurement that we can talk about as well. Okay. Um, are there any, com is that it? That's uh, it. Okay. Yeah, are there any public comments on this item? Um, Mr. Morey, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. Okay. Zoom attendee, you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Sharon Landrum, 45 West MLK Junior Drive. I've been following the pickleball court um, interest for some time now, and I'm all for this, and I think this would be a great addition to our city. So. Thank you for working diligently to make this happen. Have a good evening. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just throw something out on the table. Um, you know, some of the questions I had were um, specific to some unknowns and uncertainties concerning the funding. And um, I asked the, um, we've, we've done this in the past, and I asked the city manager to confirm whether we've we, we still do this, and, and he asked, I don't know if Ms. Lewis is here, but he did catch Ms. Lewis, and she's still here. It was able to answer the question. I, I don't, you know, the pickleball court, I, I don't have any issue with them. Um, I think originally we had budgeted 120,000, is that correct, for the two pickleball courts, but without lighting and the amenities? Yes, no right. yeah. Okay, so that's at 240,000, the three, 370, and then the, um, the four is 470, I believe. Uh, one approach that we can take is, is um, basically um, buy a little time until our finances are a little settled. Now that the residents have approved the purchase of the uh, 1.8 acres, some of the comments that you heard tonight with some of the funding to um, approve, um, to go ahead and authorize an RFP for two courts with add alternates for the third and another ad alternate for a fourth. And that way when the bids come in, we will know what our finances are better with some of these other projects. And maybe we'll get lucky. You know, maybe it'll be 300,000 for the four. I don't know, but if it's 600,000, then basically we would have spent a whole lot of money on designs for four courts that we're gonna go back and do an RFP for something less than that if we feel we can't afford it. So to me, I think this, approach offers some flexibility. Um, I'm going to get some of the comments from the commissioners first, and then I, I know, I, or do you want to say something? Yeah, let me say something to, to support that. My thing is good because I think there's still a lot of things in here that we could possibly do in-house when we're putting the bids out. Um, we do the specs. If you approved us to design in the way we said tonight, that the, the mayor just mentioned, um, we can really figure in those specs what we can do to get those costs down and hopefully the bids go down, hopefully to maybe get the four courts for the price of the three or a little less. Um, 
if you give us the approval to go forward, that's what we're going to diligently look at. What can we do? Can we run conduit for the electricity? Can we do, what can we do? And by having a bid for the two with an add-on for a third and an add-on for the fourth, hopefully we get the three prices. And by the time those bids come in, we would have the whole financial plan set up and what we're going to do and what amenities and how we're going to handle them. Um, at that time. So that would be a good approach to go in a bidding process and give you the decision with the money um, when those bids come in. Um, just to confirm, I think you said this the last time, what we're proving tonight, there's no need to come back. The staff goes straight to RFP with the concepts that are the approach that we've approved tonight. You don't need to come back with the site plan. This is the site plan conceptually and, and you just we would come back to you with the three options and the prices of all three of them for, the for you to prove the okay. bid and we'd see what the money is where we have the money from and then you'd approve which which one to go with commissioner Kuliana, she had your light on first yeah. thank you no i think um the mayor's approach is the most prudent i think the, the only question i have is is if we and i, I again this is going to get answered by your process but uh, any time that we go back and do things in stages, then we do incur more cost and mobilization, right? If we contract it, yes. Yeah, so it's gonna get a little bit more expensive rather than building the all four. If you build two and then one and then one later, you do pay more, you're gonna pay more for mobilization. That is typical, yes. Um, but I think I th the mayor's uh, idea is works the best. And, we, so we don't have the money right now, is that correct? Yes, we don't have any. Uh, yeah, right. Um, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion. Um, what well, was your? The, the one, if you want to make a motion, the other thing that I, I asked yeah. for were water fountains yes. and um, bicycle racks, which were not shown on the site plan. Uh, and again, I think that's one of the things we're in-house and what we can do with what we've got. And we've got a recycle grant for some recycle, for instance, for the benches. We've got something for the bike racks. We can pro So that's all we'll be looking at before the bid goes out. So but those will be in our RFPs and, and then we have those costs. So I'd like to make a motion that we go out for RFP in phase of two courts, at all three courts, three, add on a add, three courts and four courts and uh, and get all those prices and then move forward. I, and I didn't mean to jump. There's a motion on the floor. Are there any commission comments? Any other commission well, we comments? We need a second. We need a second. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Are any other commission comments on this? Uh, commission yeah, I just wanted to say that oh, I concur please. with this. Um, this is the conclusion that I came to separately as far as we need to bid it to find out where it is. I searched the whole state, almost to a city by city thing, trying to get proper numbers. It was an exercise in futility, I'm sorry. The closest I got was Safety Harbor and they haven't made a decision. So it was like, um, I think the DRMP uh, estimate is high. Um, I think there's factors in there that we could do ourselves as well. So. Um, I think we need to bid what we, you know, a, a concise part of what we need and, you know, go through and say, well, we might be able to do this or we can do this and we can't do that and, and bid it. And I'm in agreement with that. Did, did you, thank you, uh, I, Commissioner Eisner, I, you, did you have anything to say or did you? I understand? just was going to say what the Vice Mayor said and what uh, Commissioner Kuliana said. Uh, I concur as well. I, I don't like, you know, making decisions on something that I don't know, I prefer to get a uh, RFP and go from there. So okay. I do agree with that and that's pretty well, much. Well, time frame, I know that's important for the commissioners up here. What uh, what time frame would we would be looking at to going out to, we've got to do design, whatever else is needed um, to RFP. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I do need to do some survey, get the design done, put together plans and specs. I probably need a few months to pull all that together and get it out to bid. So, well, be realistic. I mean, a few months would be great, but I, I know yeah, that I, mean, I, I think that's pushing it compared to everything else that's going on. If, if I could say generally in the spring, <laughs> okay. uh, four or in five months, something like to that effect. We'd hope can... for February, March. At the, okay. That's what we're going to hope for. Yeah. I'll okay. get them started right away. There's, there's, I mean, I can, since they're under an EOR contract, I can negotiate a scope and fee with them right away. Thank you. Commissioner Kuyas, your lights on. Yeah, it's just a little bit further out than I was hoping that we could provide for the residents. But I want to make it clear, two courts is not going to be enough. We need to really look at everything. 
we're gonna, you know, we've got to try to find a cost between three and four quarts. And, and like we talked about with, you know, between the trees and shaded sails and even, even possibly quart lighting. I mean, there's certain ways to shave off and see what we can do. And, uh, but we got to try to get the, this project done. This will be, and I'll make it clear, one of our top projects that we can give back to the residents while we're in office. So thank you. Okay. Uh, if there's no further comments from the commission, if we have the motion and we have the second roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Now we go to, well, we've got another big discussion. Item 17, discussion and direction regarding sale of alcohol at Performing Arts Center. City Manager. Yes, yeah, so I'll bring all, uh, make our presentation for us. You, we got two people there. I just saw him, so Diane. Good evening. I'm Diane Wood, Cultural and Civic Services Director. <clears throat> I was asked to do some research on the possibility of um, selling beer and wine at our Performing Arts Center uh, shows. And um, <clears throat> my staff, um, Brandon Grock, my operations manager, did some extensive um, research on that uh, it, that is in your memo. And basically, <clears throat> right now, before our shows, we you know, are just selling bottled water. That's all that people can bring into the Performing Arts Center for our shows. But um, we also sell some snacks, and um, so it's, it's very minimal. But we do a survey every year. In the last two years, you know, we keep getting requests from um, our patrons. It's like, well, we really been, would be nice to you know, have a beer or wine before the show. However, um, if you did agree on doing something like this, we would only be selling it one hour before the show. We would not be selling it during intermission because they cannot bring beer or wine into the Performing Arts Center. It's strictly water. So my thought was, um, <clears throat> if it was approved, that we would, you know, the doors open an hour before the performances so we could go ahead and publicize that, that it would be sold only during that time. Um, we are, most of the performing arts centers in the country, you know, do sell beer or wine, you know, uh, and also hire, you know, all alcohol, you know, before the shows. But um, we really, I don't think would really need to do anything more than, than beer or wine. And we would offer only um, a small selection of that. So in <clears throat> doing the research, we found that there is a performing arts center um, actual license that we could get and also the costs are in there so <clears throat> when all is said and done you know there are significant savings from buying it from a distributor we do have our ticket sales office we can lock that so we can store an inventory you know whatever we have as far as the inventory for beer and wine and um, keep track of that you know very closely so I feel like it's very manageable there is no specific training although we would give our staff you know, training in order to sell this. And uh, we would require, of course, um, you know, proof of, you know, their, their age and, you know, their ability to, um, you know, purchase it. However, I'd say like 90% of our, our, you know, patrons are probably over the age of 50. So I don't think that's gonna be a problem, but we would, you know, dot all our I's and cross our T's. But um, I think this would be, you know, something that, our would enhance the experience, you know, of our performing art uh, offerings because we do do a lot of concerts. They're very popular. We sell out a lot of our shows, and you know, I've even I will say this, and we've got our police here, but I have noticed on occasion that there's some people that are doing some tailgating outside with their own beer and wine, like during our shows. Like they'll go out at intermission, and I was like, okay. So um, I don't know, it's, it's up to you, but I really do think it would be an, a nice enhancement for the experience and we would monitor it very closely. Do you have any questions? Uh, let's go to public comments. Uh, is there anything else that you know? Okay, public comments, are there any public comments concerning this item? Um, Mr. Mori, are there any um, public comments, remote access comments? 
If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hands to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. Okay. Zoom attendee, you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Sharon Landrum, 45 West MLK Junior Drive, Tarpon Springs, 34689. I do support the um, the um, proposal that the um, arts has. Um, I think that being able to sell beer and wine for the performances would help enhance the attendance and the experience. And so I, I, I'm sure there would be no problem with that in our, our little community. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lindbrew. Um, is there anyone else, Mr. Mori? We do not have any more raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, Commissioner comments, v Vice Mayor Lon, I'm gonna, he's, no, don't worry, and then we'll go to directly you. Thank you. Go ahead. Your light's on, right? Huh? Yes. Um, so, I actually think it's a good idea. I'm a little surprised to hear about the tailgating. <laughs> um, that's an interesting thing that we should probably clamp down on a little bit. Yeah. Um, I have some questions though. Um, there was no additional cost for employees worked into this. Our current employees, what, what ages are they? Our current employees? Yes, the ones the, that are going to be serving alcohol. Uh, they are all over 50. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 right. Second question. Um, currently, do you, do you have any sort of estimate on how many bottles of water that you sell during a normal? Oh, gosh. Brandon, could you speak to that? Um, we, so we sell a lot of water because, I mean, that's the, the only beverage we're I mean, selling. Here you're predicting that you're going to be selling approximately 150 servings per <coughs> show of beer or wine. Um, but how does that come? I mean, 150 doesn't sound like a lot. But if you're currently only selling 75 bottles of water, that's doubling wow. the amount of servings yeah. that your staff is going to have to do. Plus, people are still going to want water. I'm just trying oh, to sure. set sure. the expectations correctly. Here. Well, we have 295 seats. So um, when we did our survey, which we do annually, and we ask people, you know, what their preferences are for their concessions and also that if we did sell beer and wine, how many would be interested. In the last two years, the survey has said that 50% of the people that come to our performances would purchase beer or wine. But we sell a lot of water, you know, so I think we probably We can get those sell. figures and, and get it to the commission. Yeah, we could get you the yeah, figures, I but. I just wanted to, you know, it wasn't so much that I need the figures myself. Yeah. I need you to think mm -hmm. that water's just not going to be shelved. It's going to be still mm -hmm. so. Oh, sure. And you, I think you also need to uh, consider refrigeration. Yes, we do have refrigerators. Going to we do. Be expanded. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have refrigerators. Uh, and how long is the intermission? It's usually 20 minutes. And that's it not varies. long enough for you to. I don't really want to see people chugging beer or wine because, you know, what's, what would happen? <laughs> is that they would bring, try to bring it into the Performing Arts Center, and I don't want that. Remember, she came from the Strauss, and that's what they do at the Strauss, that they chug <laughs> yeah. the thing to get, yeah. to get yeah. back. You can drink all kinds of things there. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Eisner, please. Thank you, Mayor. So my question, I just touched base with you a little bit before this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm for your what we're trying to do, but I'm also very concerned on liability. And uh, I just don't know where the liability um, lies. I, I know we can go through the Florida League um, to get, or you know, insurance. But at what point does that insurance cover us as as um, a city? Um, if people are leaving here, and since I, I don't want to mention any names, but there are. Most people that are over 50 are also medicated as well, mm -hmm. could be. And if, for whatever reason, I've had people walk out of here who were not drinking and, you know, I don't know what medication they were on, but they almost went down the stairs in the front. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. who, 
who liably, and that's the question I'd like to know, because what I don't want to do is open up a Pandora's box of we, and you know, we entertain people, but we also wind up with a bunch of liability suits of people getting hurt. That's definitely a very good point, Commissioner. Um, you know, we did, when we were, part of the research was to find out, you know, what kind of uh, insurance we would need. And basically, um, from HR, there is this host liquor liability insurance coverage through FMIT. But um, it would range depending on the volume of uh, the beer and wine that we sell. So that's gonna change over time. If it becomes very popular, it may go up a little bit, but we've kind of factored that into what our profit would be. But as far as the, um, you know, the additional liability of people drinking, um, you know, that's why if you only have one hour before the performance, you know, I think that's gonna limit the amount of the quantity that they can consume, which I feel is probably pretty safe. And, um, you know, with the, the age of our patrons, to be honest with you, I mean, they don't, they could, they could fall or, or do whatever, you know, at any time, you know, so. So, I, I, so, so here, here's I, the things that <clears throat> just percolate, percolate in my head. Um, they could drink before they come. Yes, absolutely. And then just have one drink here. People do this all the time. We had a situation where um, somebody went into one of the local uh, uh, drinking establishments, I won't use the name, and then drove through and landed into the uh, Spring Bayou or close to the Spring Bayou. Um, I don't know how many drinks he had in this place versus the other place, um, but it always concerns me with drugs and alcohol, medications and alcohol. And what I'd like to know before I agree to this is who handles that liability and to what degree do they handle liability? Because I deal with insurance all the time mm -hmm. and I want them to cover, if they're going to cover, not just the person drinking and falling here, but uh, they need to be covered until they get home. Mm. So um, the commissioner, yes, uh, commissioner, if I can just briefly, there's actually two different kinds of liability that you're talking about. One is the premises liability, which exists regardless. Anytime you have people coming on to city property, there's always to a certain extent some of that liability that just exists automatically. Um, the additional type of li liability that you're kind of discussing when you start serving people alcohol usually involves over service. Um, and because you're going to have such a limited time frame um, of when you're actually serving people, plus the duration of the show, which gives people a significant amount of time to actually process that alcohol, the reality is that you're really not going to face that um, additional liability that you're talking about you know, where we would be liable for whatever happens when they leave here until home. Um, that would only really exist if they were drinking additional alcohol outside of what they were served in that one hour before the show. So I think in that respect, you know, that, that having it limited to just that one hour significantly reduces any sort of liability that, that, that the city would ever have for over service of alcoholic beverages in this context. So then, <clears throat> I don't, then I won't ask you the question. I will ask uh, Ms. Kardash the question. Um, and I'm sure you know as an attorney, <laughs> when you do have multiple insurance companies, we'd have a city insurance company, we'd right. have their, this insurance company, there would be litigation of subrogating who's, um, who handles most of the fault though, correct? Right. Uh, there could be, but ultimately you also have to remember, especially what you're talking about in this scenario where somebody um, has medication that could enhance the effects of alcohol, um, you're going to have a certain amount of what's considered contributory negligence where the individual is going to, to contribute to the own negligent acts that result in those types of, of um, lawsuits. So overall, I really... I'm not sure that it, it would significantly increase it. Um, looking at, at that small amount of the writer, that's actually kind of close to what they charge for just a single event. Like if the city were going to have a single event where they were purchasing an alcohol writer for that event, um, that's about really what it would be. And this would cover an entire season. Um, so uh, the other thing too, is you're still gonna be covered by sovereign immunity. 
these are just my concerns and I'd love to um, be able to learn a little more about the insurance company that we would select and I would love to be able to look at their policy and see what I could read on it um, and that's pretty much it uh, but I, I'm 100% for this I know what it's like I like you know having a little bit of uh, alcohol served um, so that's that's my take thank you thank you Commissioner Cuyas yeah, I just, the, the liability stuff, we, we sit there and pass, you know, special permit applications where people are drinking for hours on end on city property. I mean, you know, what happens if they walk four blocks away and, and slip, you know? So it's, we, we pass this type of stuff all the time and the liability is going to be there. Uh, we want to try to enhance the experience. Uh, Miss Wood, uh, the sale of um, Beer and wine will only be at this facility. Will it be at any of the, the, the cultural center, the, the old city hall at all? Um, we are just specifically looking at this facility now, and um, perhaps we can, you know, add to that at a later time, but it would be primarily this, uh, this address. And as the, we have the, the plays or the shows that happen here, there are some during the week that are in the evenings. There are some on the weekends that are matinees and just dip, mm -hmm. different times of the, of the day. So uh, I think it's a good opportunity to get people to Tarpon Springs, whether they're coming for an early dinner to come to a show or a, a late brunch or, you know, just different avenues. It really ties in the, the, the enhancement of this city as well as the, the arts that we provide. And so uh, I'm happy to support this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I just had a couple of questions. One, um, I, I know we, we still have children's programs. Um, you know, Nutcracker, I don't know if we're going to have the Nutcracker this year or not. Or, yes, sir. Um, my only concern is if we not or sell that beer and wine during performances where maybe it would be uh, mostly children attending with their parents. To be and, honest and with was you, there any thought given to that, or yeah, d uh, to be honest, Mayor, um, we do not do children's programs. No. Um, it's okay. most of the library that handles all the children's, you know, events that are you know free. We did have um, a season ago. We did have a, a big play here, which was Beauty and the Beast, the and, and that kids, was one yeah. where we did have lots of families and everything, but. Um, we're no longer doing um, the large plays and musicals here. But if we did, we would stop. We would, would have not to. have the sales. Yeah, we would not sell that them. would be your yeah. call. Okay, yes. that's fine. And, and I, I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. if we do start it in the future, we, do so, we, we would not do uh, the sales during okay. those type of programs. Um, the Cultural Center, I, I think that's an outstanding venue for something like this as well. I, I know it's a little bit the performances there or the activities there, whether it's a uh, uh, introduction to an art uh, uh, display or an art show. I, I think there would be opportunities for that too. Um, the one, the the only, um, um, in, in the only thing that I I just I, I thought we could do a better job at was actually calculating the price of the um, the the, pr the purchase price of the beverages and the reason why is I know that the, what you show in your backup is, is there's X, Y, and Z, but then there's, there's discussion concerning profit. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so sure that that's a good idea for the city to be looking at making profit. I mean, I'm not saying that, that um, I, I think what you need to do, in my opinion, is go back and look at the cost of the beverage, cost of refrigeration, cost of the staff, mm -hmm. very much like we do with the um, uh, transfer, interfund transfers, from one department to another because we utilize their staff and we charge those departments. And there may be some times where you're doing a performance that maybe you feel that you're not going to be able to uh, recoup the entire cost of the performance. You could you add a little bit of a you know overhead associated with that. But I but I think that maybe you should kind of start out, in my opinion, just start out with kind of a an idea of what you're going to be charging but I because at some point we may have to explain how do you come up with these costs on these things and I don't like the idea that we're saying well we built profit into this thing because people aren't going to understand that we're not supposed to be making a profit and it's just basically whatever our costs are uh, is whatever is what the cost of the beverage is going to be and and I think you, you know what I'm saying and I had the I had a discussion with another another person on the board and I told him 
why we did those studies, we wanted to make sure to show you if you gave us direction to go forward that we weren't going to go in the hole. We weren't looking for profit. It had nothing to do with these figures and stuff. Okay. But we felt we had to show you we weren't going to lose money, lose our money yeah. by doing that. So it's very minimal and we can adjust it. This is not, this has nothing to do with making any okay. profit or anything. It was never even looked at. We just thought we had to, she had to, and I gave her a direction. You've got to show the figures to ensure that we're not going to go into, or the board off the know if they want to go forward, yeah. we're going to be losing budgeted money doing this, not gaining money. So it, it is so small, the, the margin is something. Yeah, I mean, we'll make the adjustment. We're just looking so we're not telling you something, and then we come back to you later, and we increased our budget because we lost money for it. Okay. So profit wasn't even involved in any of the, the decisions or doing on this thing. It was to make sure you weren't so, losing. So to move from here, I given... Commissioner Eisner's uh, questions and, and wants additional answers and perhaps somebody else, um, you would be looking, let me just phrase this, you would be looking for approving, proceeding, allowing the staff to proceed and come back with a plan. Is that correct? Or, or you're, well, you're we're really towards going approval? towards the license and securing of insurance and all that and bringing that final, we'll start forward with the license process and everything and bring that back for finalization. Because we'd like to get started with the next process is to get started with the paperwork and stuff for the licensing. Well, okay. Um, just to make sure Commissioner Eisner is comfortable we'll, with all of this. We'll she get, we'll get him, him with him right, right away. Is, at, are you going to be okay We'll get with him that? right away with the insurance information. Though, but okay. really, direction to go forward to proceed with all the paperwork and license and to proceed to start this process. And I invite any other commissioners got any concern to, you know. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, Commissioner Koulianis, you didn't have your light on. You're okay with everything? All right. Um, may, what, what would you like for a motion then? Yes, the direction to move forward with proceeding with the license and the processes um, to attain the ability to do this. Okay, is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, um, if there's no further comments, roll call please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. Yeah, he's um, not let's move on old. with um, he's not item 18, appointment to the board <laughs> of adjustment. Um, we have um, basically um, the opportunity to reappoint. Uh, I, I, is this how you want to do it, just to kind of go through this quickly? Or Irene, Ms. Jacobs, do you want to do these? or um, If you'd like. Go, go ahead, if you'd like. So... Um, on this one, uh, the term for Joanne Rich has expired and she's an expressed an interest to be reappointed. And uh, the term for Mr. Hrabowski has termed out. So we have two items that would need to be done. The first one is the reappointment for Joanne Rich uh, to serve another three year term. Uh, and that term will, would expire October 31st of 2026. The second portion um, Y'all would have to determine between which way you're going to go, A, B, or C. A and B is to fill, uh, uh, to fill, move one of the alternates. Now the alternates don't have any, it's just when they were appointed, and that's what the numbers mean. Um, to fill that uh, term out for Commissioner uh, Chris Obrowski, or that you would pick from the one application we have below. If you select uh, to go with option A or B, then we would need a, a third uh, selection to fill that out, one of those alternate positions. Okay, so uh, the, the idea would be to reappoint uh, Ms. Rice for another three-year term, and then one option would be to move either alternate one or alternate two into um, the, the seat, and then C Mr. Fuchs is the only one that I see that's on the list, is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, that he would become an alternate. That would be one option. Or the, the other options, the other approach is that uh, Ms. Jacobs uh, said was to jump over the alternates um, and put Ms. Mr. Fuchs in there too. So uh, are there any- I make a motion we accept option A. Option A would have the alternate one moving up Okay. And then Mr. Fuchs goes in as an alternate. Alternate one. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then to reappoint Mrs. Um, uh, Joanne Rage. Yeah. Okay. Is there a second to that effect? 
I should okay. go to public comments too. Is there a second? We'll go to public comments. And you said Joanne right to reappoint and to uh, Robert Wood to uh, fill the alternate one. No, Robert Wood would go to fill the the vacancy. The unexpired term of Mr. Herbowski. Okay, I'll second that. Okay, uh, public comments. Are there any public comments? Um, Mr. Mori, is there any uh, remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, thank you. If there's no further commission comments, may um, I have roll call? Actually, wait, there wait, is. Wait. <laughs> um, Commissioner Eisner, you've got... Uh, yes, okay. yes. So, <laughs> I don't have a problem with um, Joanne Reich being reinstated. And I truthfully don't have an issue actually with putting Robert Wood in, but um, we have a situation where um, Timothy Grossman has been here longer um, than Robert Wood. Um, so I, I do think we should also consider that because, you know, it's, it's experience when you're sitting on these boards um, to not bypass someone who's just, you know, sitting there and doing nothing you know they they do vote when, once in a while um so i mean i'm more leaning towards not accepting this but putting um mr grossman up and then moving um i believe it would be mr fuchs in as an alternate behind robert wood okay let me um uh, Vice Mayor Lund, do you have any comments? I absolutely concur with with uh, Commissioner Reisner. Okay, let me go to Commissioner Koulianis. Would you like to amend your motion? No, I'd there? like to keep. I'd like Robert Wood to move up to fill the vacancy. So I want to. I'm going to. I'm not going to change my motion. Okay, <clears throat> um, Commissioner Koulianis, any change on your second? No, I'm going to keep it. Okay. Um, we have a motion and a second on the floor, and um, let me ask for roll call. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? No. Vice Mayor Lunt? No. Mayor Vatikiotis? Uh, no. Um, let's go back and do this again. Is there another motion and a second? So my motion would be what I originally spoke about was to reinstate Joanne Reich and to uh, move Timothy Grossman up to a permanent position and also at the same time just move Carl Fuchs in as, I don't know how. That would be alternate too. Right, yeah. okay. okay. Is there a second to that? Second. If there's, are there any other comments? Commissioner Kulianis, Commissioner Kulian, anything? Okay, Mo uh, roll call please. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Okay. Um, let's go to the Public Art Committee. That's item um, 19. Ms. Jacobs, if you could explain that, please. Um, yes. The term for uh, Mrs. Jennings, um, who's a regular member, and for Sonia McGrath, who's an alternate, number one, um, has expired, and both would like to be reappointed. Also, the term for Robert Stackhouse has expired, but he does not want to be reappointed. So the, the two things we have to do is the two uh, reappointments, and then for that third position, which would be uh, Robert Stackhouse's um, term um, or position, uh, we would have to, again, either select from the alternate one or two or from the item below. If we do A or B, then we would have to also uh, move <coughs> up one of the, uh, the, the applicant for an alternate. And then Katie Taylor is the only option to- That's correct okay. at this time. Ms. Taylor, Ms. Taylor, okay. Um, are, are there any public comments on this one? Um, Mr. Moore, are there any remote access comments?
If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. Okay. Zoom attendee, you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. Chris Wabosky, 1602 Gulf Beach Boulevard, Tarpon Springs, 34689. I was torn about calling in about the previous item for the Board of Adjustment. And I just missed hitting the button in time. Uh, so I thank you for making the right choice. Mr. Grossman will do very well. Uh, worked in, with him for quite some time now, and I'm very pleased that you made the right decision. And uh, you definitely want to consider people that have been sitting there as alternates, giving them due consideration. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other remote access comments concerning the Public Art Committee? Mr. Mori. We do not have any more raised hands at this time. Okay. Uh, commission comments, um, any suggestions? You want me to make a motion? Is that the question? Well, just, just get some ideas out there so we don't wind up doing what we did last time. <coughs> okay, uh, so. See if we can get a consensus a little bit. Go ahead. I think, you know, reappointing Joan Jennings and, and Sonia McGrath is, is pretty much a no-brainer. I'm a little confused about, about Option A there, which is Sonia McGrath. Again, I don't think she can fill two positions. So um, I would prefer if if we reappointed Joan Jennings and Sonia McGrath and put uh, Katie Taylor in his alternate one. Is there any other ideas along that line or I any mean, other didn't, changes? Didn't we just, Commissioner, yeah. uh, Commissioner didn't we just say that we're not going to skip people? So we're not going to skip people. Let's be consistent and, and just do that. Because why are we reappointing people who are, you know, they're they've been expired. So which, by all means, this is one of the great reappointments for our public art committee, no doubt. But let's be consistent if we're going to do what we just did before. Sorry, yeah, I apologize. Um, just for clarification, since uh, Sonia McGrath, she's being reappointed as an alternate. Just so everyone's really oh, clear. Okay, so this is Joan, reappointing her as an Mrs. alternate. Mrs. Jennings is a regular member. Uh, Mrs. McGrath is an alternate member. So you could either leave her as an alternate member or appoint her to Robert Stackhouse, and then the the um, the one remaining the applicant could either go as the alternate member or or the regular member. Now I'm more confused. <clears throat> So, <laughs> okay, so Sonia McGrath. So, Mrs. Jennings, be there's no, it's just no, that's straight reappointment. We need to be clear about it. That's fine. Um, are there any more? Uh, Commissioner uh, Koulianis, yeah. go ahead. Okay, so Joan is stays. Sonia moves up from an alternate to a permanent, right? Then Don Arbatello moves up to alternate one, and then Katie Taylor moves up to alternate two. No. Um, right? Uh, how this is? Don could stay too, because there's really no difference in the alternates other than the the date of appointment. Okay, but there's is there no room for Katie Taylor to come up? Is there room for Katie Taylor to come up as an alternate? So, if in the case scenario that you just said, it would be uh, reappointing Mrs. Jennings, okay. uh, moving Mrs. McGrath to the regular member that Robert Stackhouse held, and moving Mrs. Taylor as alternate one. Oh, okay. Now I understand it. So moved. <laughs> and I'll second that. I'll second so that. Uh, it's Commissioner Kuyashi. I can understand no, that. Okay. Right. These are all different, so they do get confusing, so we have no, to try I, to think of all Ms. options. Ms. Jacobs, I appreciate you being here and explaining <laughs> this. So um, thank you for that. Um, we have a second. Commissioner yeah, Kuyashi, you have your light on. Go ahead. Are oh, you done it? Okay. Yeah, All right. Uh, we have a second. I uh, second it. No further comments. Roll call, please. Commissioner Kulianis? Yes. Commissioner Kulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, 
item can, 20. Can I make the, a quick question just to Irene well, before we go? go ahead. Irene, can we do something with these um, alternate things? Because sometimes when I look at these, and I'm familiar with this, it has here, you know, that somebody was, like Robert Stackhouse was an alternate one, and he uh, filled an, un, you know, a unexpired term. But I, I, by having that there, it kind of makes me think that we have two alternates, if you know what I mean. Yeah, um, the only thing is I know with our new agenda management, we did get a board, um, a board option um, that could help us with some of these because we can only go by what the liaisons tell us. So some terms, or we don't have no application, so we can't even bring it forth um, to, you know, to fill any of the positions sure. without application. So we're hoping this we're would help. Yeah. yeah, we're working on it, and hopefully that'll help. But regardless, it's still a term. And until they have, other boards don't have term limits. Some of them don't. So according to our current rules, they can serve them up, they could serve up to 10 years. So it's kind of been. Well, I know you keep tabs on term limits and when they did in a, uh, a uh, unexpired term, but would that be necessary for us to see? Because we're just, putting people into position. Uh, we can look at that. You know what I'm saying? Just to leave that particular, because that doesn't matter to us whether they are filling an unexpired term or not. That's all. Okay. I'm good. Uh, did we have roll call yet? Yeah. Okay, we, we did. Done. All right. Now we're Sustainability Commission uh, Committee. Um, Ms. Jacobs, please. Um, so on this one, the term for Karen Gallagher, who was a regular member, has expired, and she does not wish to be reappointed. Also, Jennifer Brassy, who was the alternate two, has, uh, she was appointed in uh, last November, and she's never attended any of the meetings, mm -hmm. and she's currently living out of state. Um, so the option would be A or B in this case. You could either move up the current alternate one, which is Robin Sanger, to fill the vacancy for the regular member. And that term would expire September 30th of 2024. And if you do that, you would have to appoint a new alternate. Or you could do B, which is um, there's, we only have one applicant and um, and then you would leave the alternate as is. Yeah, show bond the um... Right. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, public yeah, comments. I make, uh, make a motion we move uh, Ms. Sanger up to the permanent position and uh, appoint, um, is, is that a, that's a gentleman or? Chauvin. Chauvin. Chauvin there, woman. Oh, Chauvin, um, into the alternate position. I'll second that. Okay. Let's go to public comments. Any public comments? Post 901 Bayshore Drive. Uh, Robin Sanger has been on the list for quite a while, and it, I think it's time to let her have a position, and she will be very, very good on this committee. Mr. Morey, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can I uh, ask one thing? Yes. Is there some need, don't we have to take Ms. Bracey off? Um, I mean, I, I don't see anything in the motion that removes her as, as a member where she should be removed. I'll amend my motion to okay. remove. Uh, what is her name? Gracie. Yeah, Ms. Uh, Gracie. And then put Ms. Yep. Sanger in, in her well, yes. It'd just be empty because there's yeah. no. It'd just be empty because there's no other applicants and stuff. Yeah. Okay. It would be an empty position. Does that cover it, Ms. Jacobs? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. Roll call, please. Commissioner well, Colina. I got a second. His yeah. amended. Go ahead. I just did. Okay. okay. <laughs> Roll call, please, Ms. Jacobs. 
Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? All right, if we get the next two wrong, we're in trouble. So the Historic <laughs> Preservation Board. Um, They're getting close. Yeah. Um, Ms. Jacobs. <laughs> so this one's easy. This one is just that uh, Mrs. Hallett's it, uh, term expired, and she's an expressed uh, to be reappointed. That's the only Don't option. <laughs> but, but is there a motion? Yeah, I just Call, did. Comment. You want to ask for comments first? Want to ask for I can, we can make, you can make a yes, motion at any time. Yes. Motion can be made at any uh, time. Public comments. Are there any public comments? This is um, on the Historic Preservation Board. And was there a motion? I not made yet, a motion. Right? Yeah. You yeah. made I'll, a motion. I'll and second. A second. Yeah, okay. And the motion is to appoint Ms. Hallett, uh, reappoint Ms. Hallett to the board. <coughs> any public comments? Uh, Mr. Mori, are there any public comments, remote public comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, if there's no further commission comments, uh, or let me know if you have any, um, roll call. Please. Yeah, I'll make a quick comment. I want to comment? <laughs> comment, yeah. All right, go ahead. I want to thank Ms. Cardes, because I've been, I've been watching the uh, meetings and they are looking better and better. So I appreciate your help. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Eisner. Um, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Uh, Firefighters Pension Board, um, Ms. Jacobs, that's item 22. And this one, too, is an easy one. Um, Mr. Angelou's term has expired and he is interested in being reappointed. Um, so it's just the reappointment of Mr. Angelou. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, public comments. Are there any public comments on this item? We're reappointing Mr. Angelou to the Firefighters Pension Board. Public comments. Mr. Mori, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We do not have any raised hands at this time. Okay, if there's no further commission comments, roll call, please. Oh, I have a comment. You have a comment, go ahead. Yes, we have a glaring vacancy um, on this board, according to this paper anyway. Um, there's one seat vacant. Um, it's supposed to be appointed by the BOC. Um, we we need to, this is not an, an unimportant board as far as my consideration. Um, so if any of you have people that they might want to talk to, they might want to be on this board, or any of the public has, has, uh, has uh, somebody they want to recommend for this job, I think we should should pay attention to the fact that this board is not complete. We have no applicants at this point. I know we have no applicants at this particular yeah, time. I'm glad Doesn't mean that we shouldn't mention that we need another applicant. Yes. We do try to post it as well um, every couple of months that we're in need of applicants. Usually Comment after over. Citizens Academy, which will be in starting in January, uh, hopefully we'll, that usually uh, gives us some applications as well. Thank you, Mr. No further comments. Roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Vatikiotis? Yes. Um, item 23, Ms. Kardash? Yes, thank you, Mayor. This is for the requested shade meeting. I do want to point out um, that on the first page it says one hour, um, and on the second page it says two hours. I do believe, Mayor, you had requested the two hours. I do want to let the commission know, though, that gives you the two hours, but if you don't need the full two hours, you don't have to take it. But if you think you might use it or that that time might be important for you, I would encourage you to approve this um, with the two hours. Okay. So you're requesting the shade meeting. We've got the list of attendees in the memorandum, which is correct. Correct. And then the uh, estimated time would, the expected time would be um, two hours. The two hours. And I okay. do believe you were scheduling this for this coming Thursday, correct? Okay. 
uh, February 9th, uh, February, <laughs> <laughs> November, <laughs> November 9th, okay, November 9th. Are there any public comments? All right, Mr. Mori, are there any remote access comments? If anyone online would like to talk on this item, please raise your hand to be allowed in. We will unmute the next Zoom attendee. Okay. Zoom attendee, you are unmuted. Please state your name and address for the record. Good evening, Peter Delacus, 514 Ashland Avenue. With regards to the shade meeting, uh, two hours sounds about right. Gives you the flexibility. Uh, I just want to caution you before you go in uh, that even though we have a special counsel report tomorrow, I don't think it's the definitive answer in regards to how you settle uh, with the particular suit that they're asking to settle. So please take that in mind before you do go into any executive session as to your determination. One last comment I would like to share with you. Uh, Y'all are on the board, so you don't know kind of in a way how this Zoom thing works. Uh, there's a time lag. We're on the phone and we're like a few seconds ahead. So what happens sometimes is you'll say, is there any public comment? And then you'll ask for the uh, for remote, but sometimes we don't have a chance do the star nine and if you do the star nine earlier put your hand up but it may be considered for a previous item uh, on the agenda so what i would like to recommend is that before you do close uh your motion to ask the gentleman or whoever's up in the box if anybody else has raised their hand because sometimes we'll come in while you're making your discussion and you've already asked for public comment before y'all make your discussion. So just as an option, uh, if the attendee upstairs sees a hand raise that he could mention to the board that there is an attendee wishing to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I'd like to have a motion, unless there's comments by the commission, uh, motion to uh, uh, authorize the shade meeting as described by Ms. Kardash. Yeah, motion to approve date certain November 9th, time 545. Okay, for two hours. Yeah, for okay. two hours. Is there a second? Second. Okay, roll call, please. Commissioner Koulianis? Yes. Commissioner Koulias? Yes. Commissioner Eisner? Yes. Vice Mayor Lunt? Yes. Mayor Bad Kyotis? Yes. Okay, that ends, I think that ends the agenda. <clears throat> um, let's go to board and staff comments. Um, Ms. Kardash, you're way down there. Do you have anything that you'd like to say? Uh, just thank you for having me this evening. Um, and hopefully by your next meeting, I'll, I'll be back up there. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Um, Major Ruggiero. Yes, sir. Um, City Manager, of course. No comments. Ms. Jacobs. Anything? Sorry, I have to Any, any comments? Uh, any comments? Staff comments. <laughs> All right. Uh, Vice Mayor Lund, do you have anything? Um, yeah, I'm glad to see that we actually got, or at least not officially, but got approval to uh, to proceed with the purchasing of the product or the product, the property down in the uh, on the sponge docks that we were concerned about. Um, I think it's a move forward for the city that we have more control over what is going to be there in the future. Um, and I know there was some consternation about well, why are they doing this and. The idea was to have control over what happens to it, so I'm glad it got approved. That's all. Okay. Um, Commissioner Eisner. <clears throat> yes, I also agree with what uh, Vice Mayor just said because I did see a lot of unforeseen comments being made on Facebook about the reasons for why we did what we did. And, you know, we were kind of restricted from speaking about it or pushing it. So, um, you know, I just sat on my hands, but I mean, I, I don't know how we can maybe get a better answer out there when we're trying to do something uh, to let people know why we're doing it. So if, if there's a way to do it, I mean, I'm all for it. Um, as far as tomorrow, I am going to be representing us at the Forward Pinellas meeting. Um, and next week I will be at 
representing your position at the North American uh, mayoral meeting in Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale. Yes, yeah. um, for anti-Semitism, um, and it is, there will be over 200 people there, 200 mayors, um, so I thank you for allowing me to, you know, represent you, and that's pretty much it. I just want to thank... It's an important topic to you, I know that. It is an important topic to me, um, and it should be an important topic to everybody because uh, the people that are involved in this and are maybe singling out Jews on the onset, but their hatred is not just towards Jews, it's towards Christians and anyone else that doesn't believe in their, uh, their, their deal. So don't want to see you on 8 o'clock news demonstrating or something like that. <laughs> I, I won't be hanging from any, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you won't see any insurrection. All right. <laughs> Stay safe All right. out there. Yeah, right. listen, I, I did inquire their, you know, safety routine before I went. Right. So it's, I don't want to speak about it, but it's quite in depth. So I'm sure, you know, that's it. Commissioner Kuyas, do you have anything? Yes, uh, the four panelists, are, are we taking a certain position on anything or are you just going to attend the meeting? No, I just think it's important. One of their comments was that we had our representative at their meetings and you recall there was nobody that ever came mm -hmm. and that person was invited to they, we were invited to uh, that person was disinvited or, or some something along that line so um, I think the support that we got from the Dunedin mayor was very strong in terms of some expectation among several people down there that they want to see Tarpon Springs there I, I think that from my understanding, um, unless the mayor, I mean, unless the governor's got some something that he's dealing with with regard to Pinellas County, uh, I think it will be a foregone conclusion that we'll have our own seat. So I, I just felt that, uh, you know, Commissioner Eisner has been attending all these meetings and I just asked him if he would just continue sure. attending them for somebody for there. Um, I'd go down there. If I had the opportunity, I'd, I've been out of town, and, and then uh, Commissioner Eisner enjoys going down. You know most of the people anyway. I do. Uh, Mr. Buckman from, Commissioner Buckman from mm -hmm. Olsmar, who was our representative. So that's, that's it. If you'd like to attend, anybody oh, can no. attend. It's a public meeting, so I want to invite anybody there. So, um, okay. Oh, uh, uh, Mayor, I just wanted to... Yeah, did you have something? Uh, the high school football team went 9-1 and one this year. It was, you know, pretty much... It's one of the it's one of the greatest turnarounds in, in, in football history here, and I'd like to uh, I'd like for this board to consider even have the city manager uh, reach out to Coach Friot. He he was uh, awarded and recognized as Coach of the Year from the FACA, and uh, I, I'd like to bring him here during one of the the meetings and even possibly the the young football players because they, they help set the foundation for uh, this program moving forward and. Uh, um, it's a really great thing for our community. And so if we could recognize him at, at one of the upcoming meetings, uh, it would go a long way for our community. And uh, just wanted to get your guys' uh, yeah, opinion I, on it. I, I've been thinking of some approach, whether, you know, a, a certificate or, or yeah, something, but along that line. But of course, yeah, we'll do that. Um, try and get something set up on that, maybe before Christmas so it doesn't cool off. Uh, maybe in the second December holiday, maybe. Uh, meeting so that would be okay. great and uh, at the the last couple homeless outreach groups that we've had we've we've noticed some uh, very low attendance among some of the uh, organizations and it's really just been some of the uh, police staff and myself having discussions on stuff which is great we're getting stuff done but we want to be able to have some of these organizations that attend enough where we can communicate in a you know three-way discussion or more about trying to trying to work on things and, and improving the community. So I just wanted to get that out there and that way um, try to um, get more people involved with that group that was created during that one town hall meeting a couple years ago. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Pulianis. Yeah, on the football team, let's, let's not um, do this before they, because they're going in the playoffs, so they weren't awarded a, they were independent this year. For, oh, they're not of, in the playoffs? Be, because of the rebuilding process, they were independent, but they, they still played a lot of Pinellas County schools that oh, wow. uh, they would consistently, consistently play, and they did very well. 
and uh, they would try to get like another bowl game, but nobody wanted to play Tarpon Springs. Mm. And that's a good thing. Nobody, yeah. even some of the powerhouse teams, they did not want to play. So it was, uh, no, it's, it's just it's, great for our community and just the town in general. No, Thank it's you. great. I'm all for, uh, we need to recognize them. Um, we also need to recognize that the mayor has two new grandbabies born, what, about a week right. apart from each other. So that's something, that's something that. special. Um, so I'd like to, um, I, I'd like to see how, if we follow up on something that uh, Mr. Delacus was talking about, the affected party status on that Anclote uh, uh, Pasco project. Uh, to see, um, and maybe it's something uh, Attorney Kardash can research for us. W where are they on this project? Um, and at what point do we uh, inject our uh, affected party status? Um, no, I maybe some kind of, maybe we could do some update on it uh, at one of the future uh, coming up meetings and just have an update of where we are and then at some point, you know, how, and then I'd like to, and again, this may be uh, an attorney Kardash thing, is how, how do we uh, use our affected party status to, uh, you know, inject ourselves into that process so that we can uh, express our, our concerns about it, so. We can do that because Renee Vincent's heading up, you know, organizing, watching what's going on and stuff, so we can try to coordinate that. Yeah, maybe she can give us a report on where, where we are on that. And then again, how we use that. And then from Attorney Kardash, how do we use our status and, and how do we affect that process? So. The, the, uh, yeah, there is a process and you, we, we get notified, the affected parties, we get notified of all the um, formal meetings that they yeah. have where this is discussed. And, um, but they haven't done a good job. I think the city manager will concur with that without t with telling us anything else. Yeah. And it's up to Ms. Vincent to be proactive, to make calls down there to her contact to find out what's going on. And, but I, I, think, that, um, I think that's an excellent point that we, need, we can do more. Um, we could do more with staying involved, um, keeping up with it. But a report of where we are, yep. what we know about the project, and then again, how do we inject ourselves into it? We, yeah, and all I think I the, say, the community's concerned about it as right. well. Right, so. and, and I think Ms. Vincent can probably shed the best light. All I'm going to say is I'm not convinced we get, we get two stories. Yeah. We get what the staff is doing, and we get what the politicians are telling the people, yeah. which are two different things. And Ms. Vincent, can talk. I've, I've been kind of listening, and residents out there on Anclo Boulevard have been communicating through emails and stuff, and I see it, that's their biggest complaint. The staff tells them... The, the, the politicians tell them there's nothing happening. The staff says, well, we are moving ahead with it. And it, it's like, okay, well, which is it? Well, you don't know how to flesh it out until there's a public meeting on it. But you have an excellent point. We need to do a little more um, uh, re reconnaissance or research or staying on top of it. So, yes. Okay. Is there anything else? Okay. Um, the, the only thing I wanted to ask, and I was going to ask the city manager to do this, but maybe just buy you some time, is, or, is there any, are any, any of the commissioners getting any requests for, regarding the yard waste facility as far as the, the fee that went from yes. 5 to $20? And yes, it, a is, lot. Is there any interest of asking the city manager to kind of take a look at that? I, I, we approved that, right, as part of the rates. And I know people have come back, and and I didn't have an answer for them, um, but and their 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 comments were not so much we don't want to pay anything, uh, they just felt that the five dollars to twenty dollars, and I've <laughs> I've explained everything the same as that one gentleman that he could actually um, put it at curbside, which is what he's doing. But some of the people I've talked to are, are a little more adamant that they actually want to take their own stuff to the yard waste facility and they don't want to pay twenty dollars so i said i don't know how the fellow commissioners feel about it i know you've got some feeling about it on all of this and and 
um, maybe if you can have some conversation with the city manager and then let him decide on, on what we yeah. want to do. I don't want to ask you. No, to and there's right a lot now. of things. That, okay. I mean, some people are doing it, but they also have landscape and stuff they do, and they're not just residents in their pickup truck. They do other landscape and try to do it. Other ones, when you tell them the story, like you did about how you can do it at the curb, they said, oh, well, I'll do it that way. Right. Stuff. But there are some legit, you know, there are some things to look into and uh, just let me know what, you, what, what you've heard and let me know. Yeah, let, let I mean, the simple resident that. with a pickup truck of his, his um, yard waste is something to look at. But remember, some of these people who've told you and have got back to, they have other things there. Some of them have other things they're they're doing a little in excess of just their own yard work. So we just got to flush those out and see if if we do need to bring some from what all you are getting um, to get get to me and then see if there's something to resolve. If that's the case of the single homeowner with a single truck trying to get stuff, if there's something we can do to refine some rules for them. We can look at those. OK, I, I want to uh, also remind the commission we've got our we had our meeting tonight, we've got one tomorrow night, we've got one Thursday night, and then we've got one next Tuesday night. The regular session is not two weeks from now, it's one week from now. On, pardon me? <laughs> you, you forgot about it or whatever. All right, um, it's gonna be a busy time, then we take our Thanksgiving break and we do the same thing, back-to-back -back meetings in December. Okay, and if, if, if the only thing I'm gonna ask, first of all, I also wanna thank all of y'all for filling in for me, especially Vice Mayor Lunt while I was away. And I think if you've got any holiday plans, I know Commissioner Eisner, you've already shared those with the uh, city manager. If you've got any uh, um, other, um, remember we've got some things that are ongoing and, and there's being requests for meetings that are happening all the time. If you've got any travel plans or being out of town over the holidays, please share those with the city manager. So it, I'm, I'm, yes, you know, and Trisha's yeah. calendar to those so we can take those into consideration. All right. Yeah, uh, can I bring up one more thing too? Please. Uh, just kind of your talk kind of got me going here. Um, we had a town hall regarding the Greek town thing, which from my perception and my personal perception did, did not go all that well with the citizens. Um, again, from my personal perception, sitting in the audience, it changed from, yes, we want to talk to you about this to sort of a, an overall thing of this is what we want to regulate you into. And I know this is the perception of the audience, not the, not, it wasn't the intention of the presentation or anything, but that's how it turned out. So we need to do a mulligan on this one and, and have them do it over. And because there was so much feedback from my perspective anyway, um, I'd like to see more constant updates on how this is progressing. Um, it's a very important thing to the Greek community. Um, they don't think it's being handled right, and everybody knows, you know, the background and history and so forth. I don't have to to re, to, to revisit that, but more more updates for us so we can see what's going on, and definitely more outreach. Needs, needs to occur in this, this whole project. Um, otherwise, it's just gonna disassemble and get out there. Yeah, actually, um, you, that, that's a good point. I think one thing that would really help was to put some kind of a preview of the meeting out there, like on Connect Tarp and Springs, explaining what the meeting's gonna be before people actually show up. I think that at that meeting, a lot of them got hit cold. There was a lot of techno, technolese um, used in the description of what was going on. I think even the choices were a little, not really easily understood by the layperson. But I, I think that would be something that, um, you know, I, I don't know where the next meeting is. Do you know offhand? No, but I know, you know, Vice Mayor Lunt talked to me about the concerns. Yeah. I've talked to some other ones, and we're working on doing okay. some of those things. A mulligan meeting, yeah, some I, more I'm outreach. Yeah, I'm involved with this pretty much yeah. constantly. Yeah, no, so. we 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 talked with we've talked with Renee, so we'll get you an update. And uh, we are working from when I talked to you and looking at the meeting. Um, we are working on our next steps to to right, try to uh, correct some of those things. One more thing, Commissioner Eisner. So I agree with what Vice Mayor just said. I was here also for the meeting, but. Um, I also think we might need to have a law enforcement 
just to monitor the time and possibly, you know, when people are getting a little uh, emotional, you know, it, it kind of got a little bit out of control to some degree. So I, I do think that the, we need yeah. to have that so that everybody can stick to the, you know, to the right thing, you know. Um, I, I'm glad to hear the passion, but it has to be, you know, somewhat in, under control. So yeah. thank I, you. I, I, yes. Agreed. Okay. All right, I'm going to stop the meeting. <laughs> I'm going to adjourn at 9:42. Meeting adjourned.